uh, for taking this uh, initiative and i also thank uh, all the speakers and delegates for sparing your valuable time and i congratulate all the delegates for taking part of this program thank you very much thank you professor madhu thank you sir thank you professor rajeshekar our pro vice chancellor for his kind and encouraging words without further ado i'll uh, uh, invite our first speaker uh, professor parth pratim mazumdar uh, he is distinguished professor at the national institute of biomedical genetics he is in, he is interested in the study of variations among genomes of individuals who are often clustered in social groups in geographically proximal regions so as to draw inferences on human evolution population structure susceptibilities to disease response to drug and vaccinations etc uh, today he will reveal what he has discovered in his studies on covid-19 in addition to that i would like to uh, say another word there is a side of arthada which many may not be knowing which is he has been and a very vocal advocate uh, trying to reach the authorities trying to uh, make people aware on how much we require good data to understand covid 19 he is he has been one of the most vocal persons that i know and as a covid 19 researcher i respect his endeavors uh, parthadas talk title is sprints and hops the completed global journey of a sars cov 2 variant welcome parthada thank you very much mr chanda thank you very much for those kind words uh, it's indeed a pleasure for me to uh, deliver this talk um the title may not reveal very much about what the content of the talk is going to be but the reason why i'm giving this talk to a whole bunch of statisticians is uh, a twofold one is uh, there has to be an increasing awareness among statisticians as to which particular uh, parameters can um, we need to collect data on or which particular parameters influence uh, the incidence and thereby the prevalence of a particular uh, infectious disease uh this this uh, information this knowledge was lacking uh, at least in the beginning of the uh, covid pandemic and that's the reason why if you look at the whole bunch of predictions that were made um, starting from the beginning till now it's consistently improved uh the statistical predictions have consistently improved and we are now able to um, you know get closer and closer to reality if we look back uh, uh, you know in the time series of you uh months ago or uh, um yeah a few months ago but if you go to the beginning um there was the, the predictions were horrible uh, to say the very least that's primarily because uh it wasn't very clear which parameters were influencing and we didn't have estimates of those parameters so uh one of the key parameters that one also needs to look at is this variation across genomes of humans because there is a, a lot of host um infection host pathogen interaction Uh, in this particular case course uh, the human sars cov 2 interaction and what that one needs to understand and what i'm going to impress upon you is one of the parameters that one usually overlooks in infectious disease uh, spread is um, because uh, it is the is the genomic uh, background of the host and thereby certain kinds of models work well in certain regions of the world and does not work well in other regions or, or other population groups of the world therefore it is necessary to understand the um, host uh, pathogen interaction to be able to do statistical modeling better uh, in this talk i'm going to give you um, two i'm going to give you an overview of this talk in the next 30 seconds number one early on i've been interested in the spread of sars cov 2 every one of us has been interested um we've been following the uh, trend of uh, increase in sars cov 2 and we made an early discovery uh, and that discovery was subsequently um, um validated or independent actually independently discovered by two other groups uh, one uh, was a consortium of uk us combined and the other was from finland um so i will uh, explain that and the second thing that i'm going to explain is that uh, this particular uh, mutant uh, of the sars cov 2 uh was also had uh, relied on certain parameters of the human uh, population groups and therefore what you will see is that 
Uh, they, on, on, in certain population groups, they were very efficiently spreading. In certain other population groups, uh, the sp uh, efficiency of spread was not so high. And we've been able to figure out one reason. We don't call that as the only reason, but one reason uh, why there was this differential spread across human populations. So this is what I'm going to uh, explain to you. I will share my slides now. Um, Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, Parthada. Uh, if you could just hide that small ribbon uh, yes, at the bottom. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. So, uh, like Professor Bhattacharya just mentioned, the title of my talk is Prince and Hops, The Completed Global Journey of a Mutant SARS-CoV-2 Coronavirus. I'm actually going to take you uh, uh, through a little bit of the history of how this uh, how this. Uh, a uh, particular coronavirus was isolated to talk to you a little bit about the evolution. That's all important to the understanding of the main uh, the content of my talk. Uh, so uh, like, like she said that I belong to the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, where I've been spending time and building the Institute since 19, 2009. Uh, prior to that, my whole life was at the Indian Statistical Institute. I'm still, uh, I continue to be an emeritus professor of the um, uh, Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, I'm going to run out of time, and therefore, this is my first slide, and uh, essentially to pay my uh, gratitude to the various young people who um, actually did the study, uh, provided lots of ideas. Uh, three of them are actually my PhD students. Um, so the entire study, if I were to uh, you know, seek out and uh, identify one particular person who uh, should be called the leader of the study, that's Nidhan Biswas, um, uh, who is now my colleague. Uh, a former student of mine, Arna, Chandrika, Chitrapita, Anulava, Shobhik, and Animesh are the other people who contributed uh, in more ways than one to the um, to this particular study and to the publication um, of this study. So if we go back, uh, uh, we go back to 2019, uh, a little over a year ago, maybe a, year, a little over a year and a half ago, uh, on December 30th, 2019, a cluster of 27 pneumonia-like cases of unknown etiology was discovered in Wuhan, was deported from Wuhan. So there was a cluster of cases, uh, pneumonia-like cases, and people did not know uh, what it was. It wasn't uh, a pneumonia. Uh, people suspected that it could have come from seafood. It could have been uh, carried from seafood, etc. And there's a wonderful seafood market. Wuhan is known for two reasons. One is this uh, wonderful seafood market, and the other is a fantastic uh, conference center that they have. Uh, also, they have a, an institute of virology in Wuhan, so it's really known for uh, these these three uh, major reasons: uh, the seafood, the virology institute, and uh, the conference center. Um, so, the human seafood, uh, the the, the uh, Hunan uh, seafood market was uh, closed uh, on January first, immediately after these pneumonia-like cases were reported. On January 7th, and just look at the uh, you know speed at which uh, pathogens can be discovered right now. The speed at which uh, the, the corona, coronavirus was isolated in, within seven days. Earlier, it would take months and years to isolate the virus. But here, it was just seven days within which uh, the novel coronavirus was isolated. And in, within three days after, uh, after identifying the coronavirus, uh, its genome was sequenced. The genome is not very large. It's about uh, 30,000 alphabets long, 30,000 bases long. And so it wasn't, and with today's technology, it's easy to sequence, but um, the, this, was, this was one of the fastest uh, sequencing efforts or the fastest, uh, the, spe the speed at which the genome sequence was made available to the public within three days is phenomenal. Um, the first case outside of China, so it actually traveled from China to outside of China because uh, these uh, air restrictions, etc., hadn't uh, taken place yet. So January 13, the first case was reported from Thailand outside of China. 
Uh, I'm not going to read uh, the whole thing, essentially to drive home the major uh, aspects of this spread of the pandemic. Um, on January 20th, uh, there was it wasn't clear how it was being transmitted from uh, one individual to another, whether there was human-to-human -human transmission or whether it was an independent acquisition of, uh, of the coronavirus. So it was uh, then identified that there was a human to that there was human to human transmission of uh, the chi um, of, of the human coronavirus and that was announced on uh, chinese national tv again this is a very short time because it's not easy to identify how transmissions take place but in this particular case fairly rapidly uh, all of these uh, discoveries were made um, the uh, World Health Organization on, uh, within 10 days discovered, within 10 days after identifying the human-to-human -human, uh, transmission, actually discovered, uh, declared an outbreak to be a public health uh, emergency of international concern. International because it had already traveled outside of China and it was because of the human-to-human -human transmission, it was going to uh, infect other, other individuals in other nations, uh, primarily because air travel is so rampant these days. Uh, on March uh, uh, 11th, the uh, World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. Uh, so um, after the discovery uh, of the outbreak, within about three months, less than three months, it was um, declared as a, as a pandemic. So you can imagine the, um, the speed at which, the rapidity at which uh, this particular coronavirus was spreading through the population. Uh, global cases today, a huge number, millions of people have been infected. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the uh, country-wise figures, USA tops the list, uh, India following very close behind, uh, Brazil, France, etc. So these are some of the top nations that have been um, infected with uh, the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is data from yesterday, uh, and of course, it's very easy to get these kinds of data. The global deaths have been over 4 million, and that's, that's very, uh, very sad. So many people have died because of this um, because of COVID-19 due to infection by SARS-CoV-2. The proportion of deaths is 2.16%, which is really uh, quite small. And in some ways, the coronavirus, even though it infects a large number of people, is, uh, is a very kind virus. Um, it, really, it really is not a very virulent virus, uh, unlike many other viruses, which are far more virulent. It really is uh, only killing about 2.16% of the number of people uh, it's in, it's infecting, but its uh, ability to infect is so great um, that even 2.1 percent is uh, is a very large number of deaths, which uh, uh, we really do not have ways to reckon with or um, or, or even convince ourselves that uh, this is what we deserve. Uh, we haven't been able to um, to contain the pandemic to contain the pandemic yet very well. We're not sure. So let me explain to you a little bit about uh, the biology of this virus. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded sense RNA virus with a genome length of about 30,000 bases. I just mentioned that um, it's, it's uh, 30,000 alphabets long. Um, it's single-stranded. If you look at our genomes, we have a double-stranded DNA in every cell, but this uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded molecule. It has only one strand. It's positive sense. I'm not going to explain the biology of this positive sense, but essentially what it means is that it is ready to uh, um, uh, be translated uh, to, to a protein. So uh, essentially you have DNA to RNA to protein. The R this is an RNA virus, so one step has already been killed. You don't need DNA to RNA. And then from RNA to make the manufacture of the protein, uh, sometimes uh, you, need, uh, you, you need another step. But this virus, because it is positive sense, does not need that uh, additional step. And it can manufacture proteins from uh, its own single-strand uh, single uh, RNA. Uh, there are 29 um, uh, structural proteins that this virus can actually uh, make. And that's sufficient for the virus to live by itself. We are not even, nobody is sure whether the virus should be called as a living being or a non-living being. Um, it, it, it usually cannot survive without, um, without a host, and therefore in some ways it is a non-living entity. Uh, but again, those discussions uh, are not today's major concern. Uh, I have uh, identified the spike glycoprotein. It is, of course, one of those 29 uh, proteins, the spike 
glycoprotein and I will have a little bit more to talk about the spike glycoprotein uh, and uh, those of you who are uh, will describe models of course will refer to this uh, spike mutations but um, uh, yeah uh, later. Uh, where did this virus come from? Uh, again, there is a lot of controversy. More recently, in the past one month or so, uh, there has been a lot of uh, speculation whether it's man-made. Uh, the jury is still out. We are not sure whether uh, it's a man-made virus. Uh, it may well be, but uh, um, there is more reason to believe that uh, it, it it's a product of evolution. Uh, we have uh, become in close contact with many animals, for example, Trees are being felled. Even in the city of Calcutta, for example, trees are being felled. Large high-rise buildings are being made. And in the nooks of these high-rise buildings, you can see bat in the crevices and nooks of these high-rise buildings, you can see uh, bats taking shelter and other kinds of birds taking shelter, etc. So uh, the upshot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, removing uh, removal of trees, etc., the upshot of all of this is that we have come in much closer um, uh, we are, we are much closer uh, to animal, various kinds of animal species than we were uh, even 10 years ago. Uh, so uh, the various kinds of viruses that are endemic to the animal species can now cross species barriers and uh, infect humans. So coronaviruses in bats are well known. Bats are a home to a large number of coronaviruses. Uh, in this particular case, uh, and, and in this particular case, we believe that the um, bat contributed its coronavirus to pangolin, which is another animal species. And then pangolin came uh, from the pangolin. Um, uh, we uh, we uh, were infected by the pangolin. And the reason why uh, we believe that we were infected by the pangolin, uh, I'll tell you a small story right now. Um, so this uh, the, the pangolin and the bats live in close proximity. So that was one species barrier. Uh, and then what happened was shortly after this uh, outbreak of these uh, 27 cases that were identified in Wuhan, um, near the Honan seafood market, uh, in an agricultural field in China, not so far from this place, uh, not so far from uh, Wuhan, two farmers um, uh, discovered one morning two pangolins that were dead with a lot of froth in their mouth, etc. And uh, they then uh, looked at, uh, you know, they, somebody uh, did some research on the two dead pangolins, collected uh, the froth, collected, uh, you know, lung lavage, uh, fluid from the lung, and was able to identify and isolate a coronavirus. They sequence that coronavirus. So uh, essentially, we believe that uh, we got our coronavirus from the bat via the pangolin because if you look at the sequence identity, uh, alphabet by base by base, nucleotide by nucleotide, if you look at, uh, compare the sequences of the human coronavirus with the bat coronavirus and the pangolin coronavirus, we come closest to the bat and the pangolin coronavirus. So we believe that we, uh, um, uh, it's just a product of our coming in close proximity with these animals and there was a, a species breakage and we got, got our coronavirus from, uh, from the bat uh, via the pangolin. Uh, there is the other story that's uh, that's uh, developing in terms of the Institute of Virology that there is in Wuhan, where uh, they do research on coronaviruses, and this particular coronavirus may have leaked out from there. Some of the Nobel laureates also believe that uh, that may have happened, but still we don't have um, definitive evidence or proof that it uh, that has happened. So we will continue to believe that it is a product of uh, evolution that we have, in, uh, we have gotten this uh, coronavirus uh, from the bat via the pangolin. Uh, I, uh, incidentally, this is not the first time that we have uh, we've been infected by a coronavirus. There have been uh, previous outbreaks of the coronavirus, the Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome. The, the, uh, um, so uh, there, there have been previous outbreaks of similar viruses and therefore uh, this is not really the first time that we are encountering such a virus. Um, I want to draw your attention to this particular, uh, to, to the top right hand corner of my slide, uh, where uh, these, these are various sequence, these are uh, sequences of a particular region um, of, the, of, the, of the RNA of the, uh, coronaviruses uh, that have been isolated from the pangolin, from the bat, and so on and so forth. And I uh, wish to draw your attention to a particular amino acid position. These amino acids are building blocks of proteins, and uh, every uh, uh, three nucleotides uh, of the RNA make up uh, uh, an amino acid. So I'm looking at the 614th amino acid position. And uh, uh, this, this amino acid position is 
uh, across the various species at that particular position 614, you see the letter D. This is a single letter amino acid code. This stands for aspartic acid or uh, aspartate. So uh, D stands for aspartic acid. Aspartic acid is uh, an amino acid. And we'll keep that in mind that 614, at position 614, most of the um, uh, coronaviruses of, that belong to this uh, this coronavirus that we've been infected with, at position number 614, they have this amino acid uh, called aspartic acid. I just mentioned that uh, viruses, whether you can call viruses as, li as living or uh, non-living, is has been debated. Most likely, it's uh, since it cannot survive without their hosts. It's called as a uh, it's viewed as a non-living entity because they can't uh, they can't survive without their host. Uh, to be able to replicate, they have to enter the host cells and use host cell machinery in order for them to survive. So if you cut off the host cell machinery, they cease to survive and therefore they are not autonomously replicating and therefore they are called as non-living or they cannot be called as living entities. Uh, this, uh, it's important that they have to, it's important for you to remember that they have to enter the host cells and they have to use the host cell machinery. Uh, in this case, the host is the human. Please remember uh, that when I call, call, uh, talk about host, I'm really talking about the human. Uh, the viruses, therefore, since they have to use their uh, the host cell machinery for themselves to survive, natural selection cannot have it that the viruses will kill their hosts because if they kill their hosts, they themselves cannot replicate. So in some ways, viruses don't really want to kill their host. And in this particular case, um, SARS-CoV-2 is a particularly kind coronavirus. If you compare with uh, the host mortality, uh, caused by uh, previous coronaviruses such as SARS-CoV-1, 11%, uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, 34%, SARS-CoV-2 is less than 3% or 2.16% by the correct estimates. So in some ways, this coronavirus is very, very uh, kind, and, uh, and therefore they are able to survive because they are not killing their hosts, and their ability to survive means that they're able to spread better. So all of this comes as a corollary of they are not killing their hosts. If we uh, look at, again, this is another way to look at where did it come from. So uh, again, I'm not going to spend any time on this. This is a phylogenetic tree of uh, sequences drawn from uh, various kinds of coronaviruses, coronaviruses from uh, various uh, animal species, multiple individuals of uh, uh, the same, uh, same species. And what we find is that uh, this is SARS-CoV-2, uh, the one in orange. Uh, in the in the bottom uh, branch of this particular tree, SARS-CoV-2. These are these are multiple sequences of SARS-CoV-2 drawn from different individuals, and they all uh, cluster together with the bat coronavirus and the pangolin coronavirus. Again, um, uh, testifying or at least providing uh, stronger support to the fact that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus was derived is a derivative of the bat coronavirus via the pangolin uh, via the pangolin. So um, th this is yet another evidence. Um, does SARS-CoV-2 um, have any preference for different human cell types? So if you look, out, look at our entire human body, there are very many cell types, different kinds of cell types. Uh, there are immune cells, there are uh, you know, epidermal cells, uh, all kinds of cells. I don't want to rattle off names of various kinds of cells. But even uh, in the class of immune cells, there are what's called T cells, B cells, macrophages, and so on and so forth. Um, so there are different cell types. So the uh, question that arose is that, uh, is it possible that SARS-CoV-2 prefers certain cell types, in which case we need to target those cell types to be able to eliminate the SARS-CoV-2. So we need to understand uh, whether there is a preference for host cell types of the SARS-CoV-2. And the answer is yes, uh, they, they have a preference. They have a preference. They enter through the uh, nasopharyngeal uh, pathway. They enter through the nose, uh, through the pharynx, and then go to the lungs. So they have a preference for the lungs, but they also are uh, found in other organs of the human body. But early on, what was uh, found is something very interesting, that this, uh, you know, human cells... Uh, express various kinds of proteins on their cell surface and um, uh, various kinds of proteins. And one of the proteins that it expresses on the cell surface is called the ACE2 protein that's also involved in other kinds of human diseases, human phenotypes, etc. This is called the angiotensin uh, receptor, uh, angiotensin ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme receptor, somehow related to blood pressure modulation, but it is expressed in a 
in large quantities uh, on on, um, on on cell types that are present in the lung. Uh, again, uh, not all cells of the lung, but again, certain kinds of cells, and I'm not going to get into the gory details of that. So um, uh, these are called pneumocytes anyway. There are different types of pneumocytes, etc. But but the, the uh, take-home message or the major point that I'm trying to make is that any cell in the human body that expresses the ACE2 protein at a high level on its cell surface is uh, attractive to SARS-CoV-2 because it goes and attaches itself to those cells. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful looking um, uh, entity, as you can see, and those are the spike proteins that uh, embellish the surface of the, uh, of the virus. And those uh, spike proteins actually will go and bind to the ACE2 on the human cell surface. That's how the um, uh, virus will actually go and bind to the human cell. It first needs to bind and then needs to enter the human cell. If it doesn't, if it's unable to enter, then it cannot use the uh, human cell machinery in order to replicate. Uh, and, and therefore, it needs to first bind to the human cell surface and then crack open the human cell surface, enter the human cell, and then hijack the human uh, host, uh, human cell machinery for it to replicate. And that's, that's what happens. This spike protein keys, plays a key role in both of these uh, um, uh, both of these phenomena. The first phenomena is that it needs to go and attach itself to the human host cell. And the second phenomenon is that it needs to crack open the human host cell uh, barrier, the, the, um, uh, yeah, the, the host cell um, the cover, uh, the covering of the host cell. I'm trying to not use too much of, uh, uh, you know, jargon, biological jargon, and therefore I'm sort of groping for words. But anyway, simpler words. Uh, anyways, um, so it needs to go and bind. It, ne it needs to crack open the host cell and enter. So both of these are actually, the spike protein plays a role in both of these phenomena. Uh, you need to understand the spike protein a little uh, better in order to uh, understand why the spike protein uh, is so important from even the modeling point of view because modelers are using uh, accumulation of mutations, variations in the genome of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, CoV coronavirus in order to uh, build these models because mutations elsewhere don't matter so much. It's primarily mutations in the spike protein that matter uh, in, the, in the sense that it's, its ability to transmit, its ability to spread itself depends on mutations that accumulate in the spike protein. And uh, these mutations have been made use of or the rate of mutations in the spike protein have been made use of in modeling. Uh, so the S, the spike protein denoted as S comp uh, comprises two subunits, comprises two components. One is called the S1 component and the other is called the S2 component. The S1 component actually binds, recognizes the ACE2, which is the host protein, and that's what it binds to. So one component of this uh, entire subunit is for uh, attachment to the home human host cell, and the second subunit is for fusion, uh, breaking the human host cell uh, boundary and barrier and getting into the host cell. But it's important to realize that unless these two subunits, unless these two components are, um, uh, are separated, they're usually attached, and then there has to be a cut, there has to be a cleavage between these two uh, subunits, and the two subunits have to separate before they can actually perform their functions. So this separation, the cleavage is uh, extremely important and this cleavage uh, is actually facilitated <coughs> by a, a human host protein, by the host protein. Okay, so there are two, uh, let me just look at my, okay. So there are uh, essentially two proteins that are uh, involved. One, I've already uh, told you, this is the ACE2, this is the human host cell receptor that facilitates binding of the spike protein the S1 subunit of the spike protein to the surface of the human host cell. Then what I've told you is that it needs to crack open the host cell, uh, host cell uh, membrane uh, and get into the host cell. And that cleavage, that, that uh, cracking open, is again held by a human protein, which is called Tempras 2. So Tempras 2 is uh, what's called a prote uh, uh, serine protease. A protease is a, is, an, is, is a molecule that can cut a protein. So this uh, membrane is cut by this uh, serine protease called Tempras 2. And again, you don't have to remember any names. You don't have to remember anything except that there are two phenomena involved. One is attachment. The other is cracking open the cell membrane and entering for the coronavirus. Both of these are uh, done by two components of the spike protein and therefore 
any changes in the price spike protein might actually alter uh, either of the either or both of these functions. One is attachment, its ability to efficiently attach to the human host cell. The second is its ability to crack open the, uh, the uh, membrane and get into the human host cell. Again, uh, also remember that here is the interaction between proteins of the virus and the proteins of the human host cell that are taking place. One needs to understand this interaction to be able to uh, understand the biology and the virulence, uh, bi biology of spread and the virulence of this virus. When this, uh, when this um, uh, you know, uh, outbreak took place, uh, fortunately, there was already, there is a, a huge community of uh, um, virologists and genome scientists who have joined their hands together, um, in, who have joined their hands together in order to, uh, let me use the word conquer, we haven't actually been able to conquer, conquer the influenza virus. And what they do is the influenza virus also mutates, rapidly changes, just like the coronavirus has been rapidly changing. The influenza virus also rapidly changes. Uh, there is a, a the, uh, early on, there was a, a, several years ago, there was a, there's a vaccine that has been found to be effective against the influenza virus. But that vaccine uh, uh, reduces its efficiency as the influenza virus actually uh, mutates and changes its genetic character. So each year we need to take uh, um, um, a vaccine against the influenza, uh, against the influenza virus, but each year the vaccine is slightly different. So the vaccine, influenza vaccine manufacturers don't uh, ma m m identify the vaccine to be to be uh, marketed the next year. And every year, the vaccine that many of us take, uh, the influenza vaccine, is slightly different from the parental vaccine that was originally invented or discovered. Uh, so here also, so es essentially, one needs to track uh, the influenza virus. And these, this group of scientists, virologists and genome scientists, have been doing just that for many, many, many years. And they have built a database of genome sequences of the influenza virus called GIS EID. It was, uh, it's essentially meant for the influenza virus, but when this uh, coronavirus came about, we were not sure whether it's an influenza virus because the symptoms were like pneumonia, uh, very, very uh, close to the influenza symptoms. And therefore they felt that it may be a, a, a relative of the influenza virus. So they started sequencing it. And I told you that it was sequenced in a very short period of time. Uh, and then they started putting up these data on the same database called GIS EID, which is essentially an influenza database. But now it's very, very rich with uh, uh, sequences of the SARS-CoV-2, genome sequences of the SARS-CoV-2. So early on, immediately after the um, outbreak in Wuhan, we started, because of our interest in evolution uh, of genomes, uh, we got very interested and we started tracking it. And as you can see that, um, you know, the, the virus started not only spreading, but also uh, accumulating mutations, accumulating changes, and it was actually becoming quite divergent. And this essentially shows both its, uh, um, uh, its spread, its uh, expansion, as also its divergence and various kinds of uh, new mutations. The, any changes in the DNA are called mutations. Many new mutations were accumulating. These are natural mutations. Nothing needs to happen. I mean, just by nature, just by through process of replication, these kinds of things happen. And we, as we are able to estimate the rates, et cetera, uh, which are again used for various kinds of modeling purposes, both evolutionary modeling as also um, prevalence more epidemiological modeling. So we analyzed about 3,500 SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences and we, uh, 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 this paper is very well cited primarily because we made the uh, world's first discovery of a particular type of coronavirus that was spreading very rapidly, uh, outpacing the other uh, varieties, other mutant varieties that were already uh, uh, circulating in the human community. Uh, and I'll uh, spend a little bit more time uh, about this. So this was, uh, there was a special issue of the Indian Council of Indian Journal of Medical Research that was published. And uh, we were, this, this paper is a commission paper and uh, you know, it was published in May of 2020, um, not so long after the original outbreak was discovered. So we said that there's a specific kind of mutation and we discovered that it was making a selective sweep uh, uh, outpacing all of the other uh, varieties that were there. Shortly thereafter, one in uh, June and the other in July, uh, there were two other uh, papers that came, made the same discovery independently, one from Iceland and the other from US-UK uh, combined. 
uh, both of them actually, uh, both of these papers, uh, these three independent studies actually discovered exactly the same phenomenon and exactly the same biological phenomena uh, as well. Um, so uh, let me quickly tell you that uh, as, as these uh, coronaviruses are spreading and they were evolving, there were genomic changes that were uh, accumulating in the, uh, in the genomes of these coronaviruses as, as it was evolving. I uh, recall that I mentioned about this particular amino acid position called 614, uh, and I showed you that this 614 had the D amino acid, the aspartic amino acid, uh, or aspartate as it's also shortly called, aspartate at position number 614, and that was true of the bat coronavirus, pangolin coronavirus, and various uh, copies of the human uh, SARS-CoV-2 as well. But uh, at this particular position, uh, also during the process of evolution from Wuhan to as it, as it spread to other places, at that same amino acid position, because of a single change, single alphabet change, there arose a new amino acid called glycine in the same position, 614 position. So many of us would be harboring the coronavirus. Some of us would have at that 614 position a type of coronavirus that would have aspartate at that position, and uh, others would have uh, the same coronavirus. Everything else is the same, except that at that position, 614, they would have uh, a single nucleotide change that would lead to a change in amino acid called glycine. And uh, so th th there, were, th there was a whole, whole series of coronaviruses, uh, O, which is the original uh, form, and then B, B1, B2, these are uh, other kinds of coronaviruses, are the slightly different coronaviruses uh, that evolved during that period. And all of them had D, except for these two uh, varieties. Uh, these varieties have been renamed, by the way, um, uh, that used to be called as A2 and A2A, these two varieties had, at that position, 614, uh, the glycine uh, amino acid instead of the aspartate amino acid. We'll just remember, we don't need to remember all of this. All that we need to remember is that some of these varieties have uh, the aspartate D amino acid, and some of the varieties have the G amino acid. So we started tracking, and we started looking at the phylogenetic relationships among the newly evolving um, evolving um, strain, not strains, variants of the virus. And what we found by March 2020, remember uh, in December, middle of December is the, is the first uh, report of the outbreak. This is about three months from the first outbreak. Uh, in March 2020, there, was, there were many uh, varieties or variants of the coronavirus that arose. But as you can see in, on the right-hand side of this uh, circular phylogenetic tree is A2A and A2. About 50% of all individuals who were infected uh, with the coronavirus already had uh, the, uh, the G coronavirus, 614G variant of the coronavirus, even though evolutionarily the 614D is the most ancestral form. Um, so in, uh, initially it will be the ancestral form and then there will be another mutation that will arise and then arose this A2A and, and this A2A started to um, uh, spread through the population. Uh, again, this the spread became larger and larger, so it's about 80% now, and by July, it's about 90% uh, of all of the individuals who were infected with the coronavirus had uh, 614G uh, instead of B614. Uh, so instead of the aspartate, the glycine uh, amino acid, the change to the glycine amino acid enabled this particular variant to spread very, very, very rapidly uh, in a very short period of time. Um, and we needed to understand the biology of this spread. What does this particular change, and this is in the spike protein, what does this particular change in the spike, how does it uh, enable the virus to spread so efficiently, et cetera? Uh, we, we started to, uh, um, you know, ask those kinds of questions. So obviously there were two, one of, one of two things could happen. One is that this particular change in the spike protein enabled the spike protein receptors to bind to the ACE2 of the human host on the human host uh, cell surf, on the human cell surface, either that could happen, efficiency in binding increase, or uh, it could also happen that the, this particular change enabled uh, the um, uh, variant coronavirus to be able to crack open, to be able to break open the uh, cell membrane of the human cell host and enter. Both of these things could also have happened because of this change in, uh, from uh, aspartate to glyc uh, glycine. I'm not going to take you uh, through these, the gory details of the experiments that were performed to find out uh, you know, what exactly happened. 
Uh, I will present some data to you, but won't take you uh, through the through the gory details of the experimentation. So uh, we we also noted something quite interesting, and if you uh, we were getting data by then from uh, uh, large uh, amounts of data from North America and Europe uh, by uh, at that time, and what we found was that by about this is uh, by about July, by about uh, uh, middle of July, etc. So the red uh, is the uh, G variety, the mutant coronavirus, and uh, the blue or the um, whatever this color is, the other bluish color, uh, that's the original ancestral type that had D at the 614 position. What it really means is that uh, by about by about uh, June, uh, July something, second week of July, the whole of North America and Europe, every individual or nearly every individual who was infected with the coronavirus had the mutant coronavirus and not the ancestral type coronavirus. So this mutant coronavirus really uh, was a super spreader, and it spread so well. Well, we started looking at other regions of the uh, of the of the of, of the world as well, and when we looked at East and South Asia, uh, what we found was that uh, this uh, this uh, coronavirus, the mutant coronavirus, was unable to sprint through the population. It was hopping in the population, as you can see. The uh, top panel is characteristically quite different from the uh, bottom two panels. The bottom two panels, uh, the population are primarily Caucasian populations, and in the top panel, they are uh, primarily non-Caucasian populations. So essentially what was happening is that it was only able to hop um, its way through in uh, the, in, in the non-Caucasian populations, but in the Caucasian populations, it was able to sprint through. Why this difference? Why is it uh, able to sprint through the Caucasian populations so well and uh, not, not, so, not so well in the non-Caucasian populations? Uh, this is something that we uh, thought was an interesting question to ask. Uh, and like I said, that it could be two different kinds of things, the binding ability to bind to the ACE2 protein or the ability to crack open the cell membrane, human cell membrane, and we needed to uh, understand what was going on. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, even reporters had identified and noted this, that Reuters announced that Asia coronavirus cases hit 250,000, but pace is much slower than in U.S. and Europe. So, uh, you know, the, the, there are, the science reporters are quite intelligent people. They are, they are looking at data, and they were able to identify that the pace of spread was much slower in, um, in Asia than in uh, U.S. and Europe. Uh, Reuters report also stated that the region where the COVID-19 pandemic started had fared better overall than North America and Europe since the first case of, uh, was reported from in Wuhan, China, on January 10th, 2020. It has taken Asia almost four months to reach the 250,000 infection milestone, a level that Spain alone is approaching in just a little over two months. So it was kind of 50% slower in Asia uh, than, than in uh, parts of Europe. Um, again, uh, it had to do something with containment, some, something with uh, you know, imposition of various kinds of lockdowns, etc. But uh, you know, at that time, we didn't even understand what needed to, to be done, what was needed to be done in order to contain the spread of the virus. So essentially, no uh, precautionary measures were, ta were taken, and it was uh, just free for all. Um, with respect to the virus, and therefore the virus was spreading much better. So it was it was natural. There were no unnatural uh, uh, you know impositions of lockdowns, etc. So this is this is what was naturally happening that it was spreading more rapidly in U.S. and Europe than in Asia. Uh, again, we did some modeling, and of course it was going to uh, spread through East Asia also, but it was going to take a much longer time, and we estimated parameters, etc. But these are all unimportant. Uh, right now is unimportant. So the question is, why is the coronavirus finding it difficult to sweep through non-Caucasian populations of East Asia? And like I said, that uh, two or uh, either or both of these things can happen. Uh, the spike protein latches on to the ACE protein on the cell surface to gain entry that I've said multiple times. And the ACE2 protein of the human also has multiple um, uh, mutations. Uh, any, any gene that codes for a particular protein also undergoes mutations, even the human uh, genes undergo mutations, and there are many mutations that have accumulated in the human ACE2 protein. So the question is, 
is it possible that there is a clustering of mutations in the Caucasian populations, which is different from clustering of the mutations in non-Caucasian populations with respect to the ACE2 gene? We asked that question. We did a lot of research, and essentially, the answer, the short answer to all of this is that there is no significant, uh, the last bullet point says so, there is no significant difference between Caucasian and non-Caucasian populations in the frequencies of such variants. So neither in frequency nor in types of uh, clustering of mutations did we find any differences in the AC2 protein between the Caucasians and non-Caucasians. Um, so the, then what we found was something quite interesting, that this change from uh, D to G uh, essentially introduces another cleavage site, another possibility that the uh, uh, protein will be cut. Uh, you know, you, you recall that this is the S uh, subunit, which needs to be cut into two smaller, uh, S unit, which needs to be cut into two smaller subunits, S1 and S2, S1 for binding, S2 for cutting the human host cell membrane. And uh, that uh, the ability to break into two subunits is also a function of how well the virus can, uh, can spread itself. So this particular mutation that leads to the G glycine uh, essentially uh, provides the uh, virus an ability to, um, uh, to uh, crack this or, or, or uh, cut the uh, S protein into two parts much more efficiently because another cut site is introduced. So it can cut in one of two places now instead of one place. So uh, it, can, it can cut more efficiently and therefore there are more of these subunits that become available to attach to the human cell surface and there are more of the subunits that are available to uh, sort of um, uh, penetrate the human cell membrane and enter the human cells. Again, these are these are biological phenomena that are known, and uh, this this uh, uh, the D to G mutation creates an additional cleavage site, cut site, um, in in a in a region very close to 614, and that cutting is done by what's called a neutrophil elastase, which is another human protein. Uh, remember, Tempress two is the protein that is the original protein, and here is another uh, cut site that is introduced, which is which now is influenced by another protein called neutrophil elastase. So it's quite possible that Caucasians and non-Caucasians have different kinds of neutrophil elastase or different pro uh, amounts of neutrophil elastase, so that in the Caucasians uh, it uh, the the virus can enter better, and in the non-Caucasians it cannot enter better. So that was the next question that we asked. So is it the neutrophil elastase? So essentially, neutrophil elastase is carried by a cell type called neutrophils. So it's quite possible that um, the proportion of neutrophils, naturally occurring neutrophils, is much higher in the Caucasians than in the non-Caucasians. And if the proportion of neutrophils is higher among the Caucasians, they will be able to carry much better, much, much more efficiently the neutrophil elastases and therefore help the virus enter the human host cell. So we looked at uh, you know, natural amounts of neutrophil elastase and again, I'll skip this, natural amounts of neutrophil elastase, and we did not actually uh, find any difference in the uh, neutrophil elastase. So um, uh, essentially then uh, is the, the, the Caucasians did not have a higher count of neutrophil elastase than non-Caucasians. And uh, this is not our work. This was already uh, work that was uh, done by other people uh, five years ago. And uh, essentially, we borrowed their work in order to, um, you know, in, in order to interpret the data. And uh, essentially, uh, what what we found out is that there are no significant differences uh, that were attributed to differences in ancestry, such as Caucasian and non-Caucasian ancestry. So, uh, the neutrophil elastase or pr proportional neutrophils was not the cause. So um, uh, then we looked at another protein, and the way that we stumbled upon this particular protein was quite interesting. Uh, this is called alpha-1 antitrypsin, and alpha-1 antitrypsin actually inhibits neutrophil elastase. Inhibits means that it doesn't let it function as well or uh, reduces its, uh, uh, its uh, level of expression. So this alpha-1 antitrypsin inhibits neutrophil elastase. So is it possible that alpha-1 antitrypsin inhibits elastase more uh, neutrophil elastase more in the non-Caucasians than in the Caucasians because neutrophil elastase enhances the ability to, of, the, of the virus to enter to cut open the cell membrane and enter the uh, human host cell. And so, is it possible that in the non-Caucasians, the efficiency of alpha one antitrypsin for inhibiting neutrophil elastase is higher than in non-Caucasians? Uh, non-Caucasians is higher than in Caucasians. And so, we uh, went through the rigmarole of. Uh, 
you know, molecular genetics and molecular population genetics. I'm not going to get into all of that. So there are individuals who have deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin. Individuals with deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin will not be able to inhibit neutrophil elastase as well. So we just remember that. So then what we did was to identify the proportion of individuals in different populations, Caucasians and non-Caucasians, who have deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin. So essentially, let me summarize in this box, lower levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, uh, alpha antitrypsin will lead to lower levels of neutrophil elastase, um, uh, lower inhibition of neutrophil elastase, which means that there will be a higher level of neutrophil elastase. Higher level of neutrophil elastase will mean a greater level of protein activation of SARS-CoV-2 because it will, uh, it will be able to cleave better and that will lead to a higher infectivity and better spread of the population. So if you have lower levels, if you have lower proportions of individuals uh, who are uh, higher proportions of individuals who are deficient in alpha-1 antitrypsin, you have a better spread of the population. So we look at the proportion of individuals with deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin in Caucasians and non-Caucasians, and essentially this is what you find. Uh, and the expectations are borne out. So I'll give you give out the story uh, first. The expectations are borne out. Um, the, uh, the, these are uh, individuals of uh, different kinds of viruses. And uh, these different kinds of viruses are with respect to the ones that are with G and that are with T. And uh, this is this is the level of alpha-1 antitrypsin. So the lower the level of alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, the uh, lower will be the spread of the of the disease. That's what that was the prediction from the previous slide. And let's see what happens. So in the uh, if you look at the middle column, so you find that uh, uh, lower levels of um, alpha-1 antitrypsin um, uh, is higher among the Caucasians than among the non-Caucasians. East Asia is non-Caucasian, Europe and North America is are Caucasian. And therefore, from here itself, you can make the prediction that it will spread better in Europe and North America than in East Asia. And that's exactly what we find. I've shown you graphs of broad continents. If you break it down by countries, you essentially find the same thing. So um, our discovery was that... Uh, uh, in the reason why it spreads far better in the Caucasians than in the non-Caucasians is not because of um, its ability to bind to uh, AC2 protein better in the Caucasians, but because of its ability to um, to uh, of another protein that inhibits the protein that allows it to enter the neutrophil elastic that allows it to enter the human cell. That's where the interaction is taking place. And in co the Caucasians and non-Caucasians, with respect to the alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, uh, the protein that really plays the major role in its ability to enter the human host cell is different, and that's the reason why. Um, uh, that's one reason why. That's not the reason why. That's uh, there may be other reasons we don't know, but that's one uh, prominent reason why there is such a difference between Caucasians and non-Caucasians. So when modelers were uh, thinking about, when modelers were predicting making models, statistical modelers were making models and predicting uh, its spread in various continents, the models were failing horribly in, in East Asia, in Thailand, Indonesia, all, all in Southeast Asia and in South Asia. And uh, this is, the, and they were unable to understand why it was uh, failing so uh, so miserably, and this is one reason why you need to take these biological factors into account to be able to uh, uh, you know model better, and especially in places where the models don't work uh, or there's a discrepancy in the efficient in the um, goodness of fit of the models in various uh, different regions. You need to identify these kinds of uh, uh, parameters that influence spread of uh, of, an, of an infectious pathogen. So this is this is what uh, these these were the two major findings that we made. Uh, we were able to contribute to an explanation of the failure of modeling efforts in certain regions of the world uh, through our biology. And um, uh, you know, I showed you that our first discovery was published in the Indian Journal of Medical Research. The this discovery uh, about neutrophil elastase and the alpha one antitrypsin uh, deficiency was published in Infection Genetics and Evolution. Um, the uh, I said that this is a complete. This is a this is when this when the uh, journey of the mutant coronavirus was incomplete. The uh, journey of this uh, mutant coronavirus is now complete in the sense that any individual uh, who you sequence will have the G mutation and not the uh, ancestral D mutation. So the mutant coronavirus uh, that uh, the D six hundred fourteen G the G mutant has actually completed its journey globally, and every individual who gets infected now has a G 
as opposed to the ancestral deep. So it's a completed journey, completed global journey of a mutant coronavirus. But during its journey, there were sprints and hops, and we were able to understand the biology of the sprints and hops, um, uh, which, which also impacted the modeling. I stop here now, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Parthada, for a very insightful talk. Uh, we are really running late, so uh, I would yes. request the participants to post their question for the speaker through our Google form, which has been posted in the comments uh, in the YouTube and the chat in our Gmeet. I'll just uh, maybe ask one question that has been posted by Professor Sandeep Janeja, who is also a very serious COVID-19 researcher. He writes here, I hope Professor Janeja is here. I was reading out his question. Sure. Given our understanding of mutations, what is our sense of likelihood of seeing a much more infectious, more virulent, and more immunity escaping variant in near future? Well, I'm not a soothsayer, right? So I can't really say this, but uh, there are again uh, evolutionary biologists who are predicting that you know there are these selective um, uh, selective peaks and valleys. Uh, this coronavirus probably is reaching its peak uh, in the sense that it will not become more infective at least. Whether it becomes more virulent, we don't know but it likely will not become more infective. And they have used various kinds of immunological evolutionary arguments in order to predict that. I don't know whether that prediction is going to be true. Uh, mutations are very unpredictable and we never know. But uh, again, the evolution has peaks and valleys and that's what they believe. Thank you, Parthada. Uh, uh, I'll request once again the participants to post their questions through our Google form. And with that, uh, thanking Parthada, we'll move on to our next speaker, Professor Siva Atreya from uh, Indian Statistical Institute, Bangalore. Uh, Professor Atreya has been considering yeah. the timeline of COVID-19 in Indian states by using the data uh, uh, distributed by our ministries. And his aim has been to provide a quick, high-level, intuitive understanding for anyone who is interested in studying the data and understanding the infection spread across the various states of India. His primary focus has been in Karnataka, but his methods would be applicable uh, elsewhere also, I understand. Uh, the title of his talk is An Understanding of COVID-19 Spread Through uh, Seroprevalence Sero reversion and vaccination in Karnataka. Uh, welcome, Professor Atre. Yeah, hi. Uh, can I share my screen? Can you all hear me? I'm not sure. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah, I don't know how to share my screen. Let's see. So, can I cancel Partho Majumdar's? Uh, yes, please. Yes, please. Go ahead and do that. I'm. Uh, yeah, I stopped sharing now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I stopped I sharing. Something, I did something that went. Let's see. Okay. Share. Very good. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's done. We can see. Uh, yeah, we can see. Just uh, hide that uh, small banner at the bottom, please, Shiva. Thank yeah, you. Okay. Can you see the screen? I'm sorry. Yeah. We can see it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, my internet connection is not so good today, but yeah, hopefully it will survive the talk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I listened to a very good talk in the beginning. Uh, so uh, I am uh, involved in this thing by entirely by accident. Uh, it's sort of some students want to work on this, and somehow it sort of carried on so far uh, in this area. Uh, I'm not an immunologist, uh, nor am I a modeler. Uh, I'm basically a probabilist. So whatever I say should be taken with a pinch of salt uh, in terms of understanding. And I'm also very reluctant to uh, say anything predictive, uh, but largely observational answers that we have. OK, so this talk uh, in the next 40 minutes uh, that I will do is I will talk about three things. So one is uh, just about what all work we have done with tracking COVID-19 so far. So um, 
I'll explain that in the next few slides. The uh, the second part will be uh, we've been involved with uh, a zero survey in Karnataka, and I will try and uh, explain what happened the zero survey and what it provided to the government and so on and so forth. Uh, I will do that. Then uh, once that is done, then I will um, discuss some recent efforts on on immunity waning and how it might uh, introduce reinfection in the population. Of course, uh, there's no biology in it. It's just sort of a, a modeling sort of exercise, assuming some immunity waning. Yeah, if you have any questions, you can also interrupt by talking in the middle. There's no problem. Or you can post in the chat. So uh, let me begin with the first uh, idea uh, of tracking COVID-19. So this is a, a website that has sort of grown in some sense. Uh, the URL at the top, uh, you can visit it. Uh, it began with uh, understanding. Uh, so one popular phrase I heard from some, at some talk by some researcher was that uh, the website tracks from patient zero in Karnataka, So is kind of uh, the aim of it. Of course, uh, over time, as the wave became bigger in the first round, uh, the data became more and more diluted uh, by the government of Karnataka, uh, which I think still releases the one of the best data in the country uh, in terms of daily reporting of cases, testing, immunology, uh, vaccination, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a publicly available uh, data set. So we've been tracking various things. Uh, we have trace history graphs of how the clusters went about in the beginning, Nice probability there. One can look at. One can look at how the age of the people who have been infected looks like as compared to the original population. Early on in the pandemic, uh, the government gave very detailed data, so you could even track how many days the patient spent in ICU, how many days the patient got to discharge, and so on and so forth. And of course, other metrics that other modelers use, you can also track in this website. And now the website has grown. Uh, we have a, I'll share how it has grown in the next uh, couple of minutes or so. So, uh, so now it's a, it's a large data repository uh, and it's growing. Uh, I have mentioned some parts of, of the repository here on the left-hand side. Uh, there are also several basic reports that we wrote out and you can sort of look at them, they're available. In, on the website and mid archive other places. Some are also published. Uh, uh, so it has details information about Karnataka. So Karnataka's data is now very nicely scrubbed and put out there. It also has district timelines, which I have not put on this resource. Uh, we'll soon put out vaccination data as well. I'm hearing an echo. I'm not sure that's the... So now... Uh, this took a lot of work. So this was set up by two of my students, uh, Abhiti and Nitya. They were undergrad students. And uh, so I don't know if you observed, uh, uh, government gives out data in HTML files and PDF format. So you have to scrub it. Uh, you know, no one thinks that uh, it will be useful for the public to work in a CSV format or open database. So this we have set up on the web server. Uh, and you can take it up anything you want. Uh, detailed data available. And it's government supplied data. And it's not from news resources or uh, so what are the Ministry of Health and Family Wealth have put out? We scrub it and we put on the website. Now, of course, Nitya and Abhiti have left. Other people have come in, but it was set up by them essentially in the beginning. Uh, so, so what happened was in the, in, this was March 2020. Uh, so in end, we started this and the lockdown just started. So by May or so, we got traction. So for example, uh, uh, we used to point out several errors in the government data to the, to the government departments. Uh, and slowly connections became established. Um, so, so the department came back and we set up an error correction tool for them, a simple tool that you could check for data reporting from various districts as they came in. Uh, there was a support from Gates Foundation, so now that's being built right now. We have a district timeline database. Uh, of course, uh, the data is very noisy, not quite clear. Then there's a whole sort of uh, weekly prediction that's going on right now and uh, that's been gone. Then the 
the government wanted this at the time the first way before testing became sort of very very sort of passe now now of course you can get a test anytime rt pcr tests are available everywhere in the beginning there was this issue so districts had this idea that uh, uh, you would get swabs but uh, swabs would would not be able to go to a, a testing lab in quick time because the district lab was overloaded and it had to go to a nearby uh, facility so we built a swab to a lab allocation for the government and uh, it didn't see the light of day in the application but of course the government did uh, see the presentation of it and they have used summer system around it Uh, we also have understood how to design testing and how to conduct tests like so suppose you have a certain budget you have a bunch of rt pcr tests you want to do and bunch of r rat to do and you want a certain sensitivity to observe the way the way to uh, design it is the way to then of course the two other works i'll explain are this antibody weighing and the zero survey state sorry about that so uh let me just go back so i'll just begin with the zero survey uh, for karnataka and i'll try and explain uh, what it went about then i'll explain a little bit about the antibody weighing and i'll conclude my talk uh, the next 30 minutes If there are any questions, just please feel free to interrupt me also, and also post in the chat, and you can interrupt me in the middle of the talk as well. Okay, so the zero survey was a very interesting project that we got involved in. So the government invited uh, me and uh, a colleague of mine, Rajesh Sundaresh, and I, to get involved, along with uh, the state team, uh, to design the zero survey for Karnataka. So the goal of the zero survey was in, was threefold. Uh, one was uh, you want to find out. Uh, the uh, proportion of people who had sars cov2 uh, then uh, you also wanted to understand who are currently having the infection and then you want to have a joint estimate of uh, people in the population for prevalence of, of the virus so this was uh, way back in um, august of 2020 so it's about now Close to a year back, that's when this is this sort of formulation was done. Since then, uh, we have had uh, one more survey and one more sub study, and uh, of tracking antibody weighing as well. And uh, we are going to launch a third one. The government is going to launch a third one very soon. And uh, all these uh, surveys uh, give a, a snapshot of the pandemic. So we we'll tell the state uh, where the pandemic is at that point in time. because you're going to sample from the population and you're going to uh, pick people up who are otherwise not going to be tested so you're going to have a lot of asymptomatics who carry the infection being tested and that will give you an idea of uh, the infection trend in the population so the goal was these three uh, aspects of so how did the survey do it the survey uh, did the following it was sort of a unique survey in some sense uh, uh, the state was spread uh, into 38 units um, to ensure a geographical spread so you capture everybody across regions so you don't skip anybody out and uh, so karnataka has 30 districts so 29 were thought of the units and bangalore urban was a very big district so it was split further into eight more So we had 38 units. Then, uh, within each unit, what the survey did was uh, it, uh, it it went to local uh, district hospital or the primary healthcare centers in that in the district. And uh, the state has uh, historically, uh, I mean, if you go to the standard Department of Health and Family Welfare Services, there's ICTC staff and healthcare workers who are who have done surveys in the past. so the counselors from that those departments were used for the survey and in this manner the survey used uh, existing public health infrastructure it didn't have to go and uh, set or set its own machinery up like a survey so the people would go out and draw serum and uh, take swab samples and so on so this is a sort of a snapshot of the of the pictures of people uh, of the of the sort of hospitals in the state 
let me zoom in a little bit. I do zoom in. Let me go back. Okay. Yeah. So the blue dots are the places where the hospitals are set up, and and the hospitals would go and the essentially centers and the the population around the hospital centers would be surveyed. So it, it gives you an idea of how widespread the survey was, and uh, it covered the entire state in, in, in a reasonable manner. So uh, how was the sampling done? That was a very important part of the survey. Uh, so the population was divided into three risk groups uh, in terms of vulnerability to the disease, uh, not in terms of risk after getting the disease. Uh, but of course, that, that confusion will be there as you read across the various risk groups. So the low risk people were people who we thought were at low vulnerability of capturing the disease. So they were. Um, Pregnant women who sort of will be more careful and hence be protected from it. And attendees of outpatient in the hospitals uh, who are supposed to be low risk because they're, they're coming for routine care, not sort of fast uh, food care. Then uh, people who had high contact with other people, so the auto drivers, bus conductors, uh, healthcare workers. At that time, we had containment zones. Of course, now also there is, but uh, in July, August, I don't know if you recall, in the pandemic, uh, whole wards would be cordoned off and called containment zones. And um, uh, there's also these markets and uh, malls and retail stores, which are not quite open. But but by May, I don't know if you notice, if you remember, uh, the first unlock was May. And May, June, July, the unlocks sort of opened up completely, and the country sort of opened up. And, the, and if you'll observe the pandemic's graph, it sort of the cases are rising around that time. Then, uh, then the high risk uh, in terms of high vulnerability with the elderly and people with comorbid conditions. So, and if you notice, the survey sort of picked uniformly among all these categories. And uh, so we were doing both RT-PCR and IgG, so on everybody. And on the moderate and high risk, we even did the RAT, RT-PCR, and IgG. The, the notion of doing the RAT was that uh, at that time, uh, there was a lot of sort of, de not debate, but uh, the sensitivity of the RAT was not very well established. So we wanted to understand that as well. And the survey gave very useful information on that. So rat performance much better than symptomatic patients. So if you use it only when somebody is very sick, so that you get them to treat them quickly. Uh, for asymptomatic rats, not so not so effective. And this was established by survey as well. So any reason so, the moderate group had uh, much less uh, samples than the other two groups? No, they had the same number of samples. Uh, uh, same number. It's, it's 144, 144, and 144. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, just four categories. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah three categories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And within each subcategory, I divide it into uniform. That's, That's clear, right? That's clear. So in the second round, the, uh, the okay, the sample size was decided by the uh, we assumed a prevalence of 10% at that time. So with uh, normal, if you want a 5% band of error, with 95% confidence, you want this at every district, and they assume every unit to be independent. The second round, we assumed a 30% surveillance, so we had a sample size of 1,500. So everybody again was divided a little bit, uh, was proportionally divided across each of the risk groups. So the design also was sort of uh, a very sort of uh, systematically done. So we decide that uh, exclusion will only be people who are already code positive and those who could not provide consent. And uh, uh, we excluded children, which is sort of going to be done in the third survey. But at that time, um, um, there was no schools and everything was closed. So, uh, and we were not sure how to draw some, how, how consent would be obtained for people to draw serum and uh, swab samples from young people. So they were excluded as well. So how was sampling done? You pick a person, then you have to draw blood for the antibody, uh, and then you, you remove the sera and then send it to a lab to test if the antibodies are there for the virus. You perform rat on the spot and announce the result, and you take a swab for the RT-PCR and then send it to the lab. So this requires training at the state level, and, uh, and 
there were a lot of sessions with various lab people and ICT staff again with regard to this virus. And it was very sort of, uh, for me at least, it was very rewarding to see how the state moves. Right. So then, uh, of course, once that is done, that's the easy part uh, in terms of getting samples and labs. There are a lot of logistic difficulties. Samples might get lost. Uh, samples might not go on time. Surveys may not do it on time. May not find people and so on and so forth. Then there's this whole thing about collection. So you have, uh, so I don't know if you, if you know this. Uh, this has been a largely centralized effort in, in, in India. So all RT-PCR tests are sort of centralized in an ICMR portal. So moment you take an RT-PCR test, you have to enter the result in a portal governed by ICMR, and the states can download it from there. Uh, so in some sense, uh, data is sort of stored in one location. That's one set of data coming in. Then the IG labs send data separately to the state government. And the surveyor entered uh, other data that we asked in the questionnaires in the survey into the survey app. That's the third part. So this three had to be combined. And uh, it's sort of a, this was a result in the second round. But the first round took a lot of work because there were all sorts of errors and uh, uh, I don't know how many of you have got tested, but uh, if you've got tested, your SRF ID is the sample reference ID is like sort of a, a 13 digit one, and uh, either manually entered sometimes, and a lot of errors happen. Of course, now with over time, uh, maybe by beginning of this year, the everybody was barcoded and you know, it's sort of entry was uniquely done. But in the beginning, a lot of problems. Happened. So once it was done, you prepared one line list. You have the antibody results that the IgG spike protein had, and then the RAT test is the RT-PCR tests. And you had different test patterns, right? So because some people didn't do the RAT, some of them didn't take the RAT. Uh, so, and if RAT was positive, RT-PCR was not done. Um, and uh, and you had people IgG positive, and uh, uh, I don't know if you observed one comment in the previous talk. So the person develops antibodies in the little later in the infection, not in the beginning. And uh, so you could be in a window where you have a viral RNA and antibodies as well. So, so this introduced a lot of noise, a lot of sort of different statistical sort of anomalies in data. One had to sort of, uh, you couldn't estimate each vertical differently and independently, they're all connected. So you have to have some joint estimation method, which is not hard, but one has to keep in mind that this must be done. That's about the analysis. Then the uh, the next thing, of course, was the was the sensitivity and specificity of each test. So false positives, uh, false negatives, take into account. So RAT and RT-PCR and IgG all have certain sense, certain pre, what they call it as. Uh, I don't know the exact term. As opposed to clinical sensitivity, what happens in the lab is called analytic sensitivity, I think. So these are all the analytic sensitivities. But when you do a survey, you observe how it's performing in the real field rather than in the lab setting. Not to certain control. Which also the the, uh, the survey provided. Of course, you have to set up a simple statistical model for this. Uh, so like I said before, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, you have to do joint estimation of IgG and active. You have to take into account the test pattern by the individual because if you have uh, you have you have no rat, no rat for the low risk, you have rat and RT PCR the high risk, but the rat is positive, you don't do the RT PCR. And, so <coughs> and there's sensitivity sensitivity each test. And the last point is very important. Uh, in any sampling design, you'll have a bias. And uh, so I let me just quickly go back and discuss the bias for a second. Uh, so this, of course, doesn't cover the it covers a large section of the population, but uh, you could very well see a, a section that is not being covered. But uh, the no hope is that the prevalence among these risk groups, if you average out and add up, it will represent the prevalence of people who are not surveyed by the system. But this you have to account for in the bias by, by something called design effect in the constant. In the, so you increase the range of the constant interval by adding it, multiplying it by design effect. And it's all very, very well understood surgical concepts. So then uh, what happens is that once you do a survey, you can do many things. Now, survey gives you a snapshot of what's happening in the pandemic. 
then there's this uh, I don't like uh, Professor Batham has also told that people are reporting cases that are timeline everywhere, a lot of websites around and then uh, so reported cases come and report cases are governed by how testing is done by the state and uh, how much of it is done and randomly how much done people reporting to hospitals and so on and so forth. But the survey gives you uh, what's called a CIR, that is the estimated infection by the survey and you divide by the reported cases up to 2nd September. That's when the survey happens, so two CIR. And uh, the survey found out that the CIR was 1 is to 40. That means the state was capturing, uh, on average, uh, one case for every 40 cases out in the state at that time. And uh, of course, now the time has passed. And if you look back, this was kind of at the peak. The survey was done at the peak. So in some sense, it gave a, the state a true idea of how it performs during the peak of a, of a pandemic. So it's able to capture only one to 40, uh, regardless of how well it distributes the tests. And of course, uh, things have changed now. At that time, the quantum of tests was around 50,000, 60,000. Now the state is performing up to about lakh and 80, and some days up to two lakh tests, never lower than lakh and 20. Even on holiday Sunday, when the virus takes a break, uh, apparently tests are at least a lack. So it's quite a significant improvement in the state level of testing. But at that time, the state had a had a CIR of 1 to 40. And just come down. The second zero survey on stuff like that, one can check. That data is being analyzed right now. Just keep coming down as time goes along. Then one can also do this other very, very important metric in terms of uh, reported deaths uh, and fatalities. So, so you look at the fatalities up to 2nd September when the survey was conducted. Yeah, and you compare it with the fatalities plus the pr infection in the population, which the survey has estimated. So that gives you the total infect at the bottom and the top is fatalities. And this gives you what's called the IFR. So it's sort of a, it's a very, very important uh, marker in terms of how the state is handling the pandemic. So India typically has had, a, had an IFR at, are very low and uh, this could be because of uh, uh, various aspects of how how we count deaths uh, how we report deaths and uh, and so on so forth but this sort of in the in the margin of what everybody finds in the civil service like 0.05 percent so looking first round data second round has given something else that's being analyzed right now as we speak and third round will start soon it'll give an idea of the pandemic a little bit Then uh, the survey also had other interesting aspects, which is kind of very useful, uh, which gave across these groups what the level of infection, uh, age, gender, your subcategories. I think rat sensitivity was the, sort of the was a key finding. So it was, it was very very low among asymptomatics. I think like a toss of coin. So you go to an asymptomatic person, you toss a coin, fair coin, you'll have better sensitivity than the rat. But symptomatics, it does well. It's about 0.7, and uh, so if you if you're if you're symptomatic with COVID-19, lot of symptoms, then you have high viral load. The rat does well. Then also, every district got a snapshot of how the antibodies were, how many cases they were missing, and how it is doing its clinical practices in terms of how it's handling, how many deaths there were in the, in the district. So very very so informal information. And of course, survey also connected questionnaires, which I told you about. Uh, of course, this is self-reporting. So, so we found out that uh, it, so many people were in COVID-19, have COVID-19, but don't realize they have had it because they were asymptomatic or didn't have the standard symptoms, and they recovered. But uh, if you, we asked several things about about a patient as as we surveyed them, and we found out that uh, diarrhea was one symptom that was sort of uh, very very strongly indicated that you had past infection. And of course, there are people who have not been detected by the system in terms of testing for RT-PCR. Mm -hmm. Of course, in contact also was a key driver of uh, for past infection, which is sort of believable in some sense. But diarrhea was surprising. Of course, later on, Nafkin sub substantial research is available that uh, the virus is available in the gut also, and as well in the in the nose and the throat area. Yeah. Sequence. So then, uh, of course, the, the thing is that uh, one must remember the survey has also told you there's a lot of variation among districts. So I don't know if you can see this on the on the graph here. 
So even the prevalence is like, so if you go up to BBMP West at the top, it's about 35% of IgE and uh, this total prevalence, I think, for this IgE prevalence, the antibody prevalence was 35% BBMP, and as low in Bagalkot, about 4%. So what does it say? It says that uh, in September, when the first wave was kind of getting towards its peak, some districts were not seeing it at all. Uh, they hadn't even seen the surge. Whereas if you look at BBMP West and BBMP South, like in Bangalore zones, they were quite high. They were unleashing the surge. The surge had come and sort of gone. It was a nice snapshot. It tells you how the pandemic is progressing across the state and uh, where it's coming from and where it's going to go next. And you could see uh, it went to Udupi next a little later. If you observe the graphs a little bit, you could see uh, Udupi next. It went to Kalaburgi a little later and so on and so forth. One could just check how this thing. And the same thing sort of... Uh, Anecdotally, one can observe in the second wave as well. There's also wide variation in CIR. Of course, the upper intervals, you could take a little noise, but uh, the, the middle bulk is kind of, this indicates variation in CIR. So it indicates uh, how testing policy varied across districts in the state and how it was missing. Uh, and so forth. The IFR also is kind of uh, varying as well. I'll speak a little bit about these two, these three things, uh, how one can use this to design public health responses. So let's just do a simple uh, first step analysis, if you are uh, an observer. So high IgG, high CIR, and low IFR. Uh, high IgG means that you already had people with a lot of infections in the past, so that you either caught them or not caught them. But high CR means you have not caught them. That means uh, you have uh, you have missed circulation areas, you have missed uh, testing properly, and so on and so forth. And then uh, high IgG and low IFR means that okay, so you could you could also spin it the correct way that you protected people well, you had good treatment policy, but you could also view it more likely as underreporting of deaths. So so high IgG, high CIR, and low IFR means that. Uh, You've gone through a surge, you've missed cases, and you've underreported deaths. That's the most natural classification. On the other side, if you're doing very well, uh, high IG means you've gone through a surge, low CIR means you've captured most of the cases, high AFR means that you've probably reported deaths correctly. Uh, so you probably, of course, you could also argue that high AFR means that you have uh, not. Uh, had good clinical practices, but broadly that's the idea. Okay, so that's the two buckets you must keep in mind. Uh, Karnataka's high, so let's keep Karnataka as a benchmark and compare everybody as high, low, and high and low, depending on Karnataka. So if you had IgG above Karnataka, you're high IgG. Above Karnataka means high CIR. Above Karnataka means high FR, and vice versa. So that's how low, that's how the benchmarks are done. So now let's do a simple scatter plot. Uh, so this is one of my sort of key uh, graphs that one can say. So you plot IFR on the x-axis, you plot CIR on the y-axis, and the blob is the size of the antibody prevalence in that district. So larger the blob means the, the surge has come and gone. Smaller the blob means the surge is not come. So if you look at this graph, for example, in if you're, how, what do you think you're good? It means this, this below Karnataka, on both sides, that is, these districts here are doing quite well. They have high IgG, uh, comparatively low IFR, and low CR as well. Uh, so that means they've, they've done well. They have caught cases, they have uh, reduced deaths, and so on. So Darwad is a little bit far away. There's an explanation for Darwad. So Darwad is in a district, uh, we learned later on, that uh, it's kind of the main district hospital for a lot of neighboring districts. So everybody comes to Darwad. And, uh, even now, uh, uh, the diseases are recorded or accounted for in the district hospital that they perish in. So that's why Darwad has a high IFR. So it doesn't mean Darwad is doing badly. It's just that uh, the high IFR is indicative of that, uh, that aspect of, uh, of Darwad. But it has low CIR, so it's doing quite well. Um, and, but if you look at the, the top left column, that's the top left box. That's where you need attention. That means you're missing cases. You're probably underreporting deaths, and you have had, if your blob is big, you have had high IgG as well. Your infections have come and gone as well. 
the blob is small, then you should make sure that you don't come, you don't go, you don't stay there, you come into this column. And even here, uh, if you're in the bottom one, you should decide. You don't want to go to the top guy, you want to go right as the search comes to you. So this is an interesting snapshot. You can tell the policymaker can immediately understand what to do next, how to move resources, you know, where to move beds, where to increase labs, uh, how to train people more at the hospital, give feedback to DSOs, DTOs. It's very nice. Uh, very nice. So in the predictions I told you about the symptoms and uh, various things from the surveys, uh, past infection is red and present infection is blue. Of course, this we know, you know, if you have chills, fever, headache, nausea, that's sort of COVID-19 uh, symptoms, and they were kind of strong indicators. Yeah. So they will RT-PCR positive, red were antibody. That's part of the zero survey. So now let me get into this. Uh, uh, I already have said anyway. Sorry. Nothing. Uh, just uh, maybe some code is missing. Okay. Okay. So now uh, let me uh, shift to the next topic uh, of uh, antibody weaning. So we had the first wave, we had a snapshot, and we all there was a lot of herd immunity and uh, how the virus was done and dusted in India and so forth. Uh, uh, I always felt that Karnataka was uh, was very much like UK. Right? And see, if you look at UK, I just make it a little bigger so you can all see this. So Karnataka, for example, is Mirrors UK in many ways. Population is 70 million in, in UK in Karnataka, about 68 million in UK. Uh, the size of UK is about 190,000 square kilometers, uh, and Karnataka is around that range. I think size of UK is 200,000, and then Karnataka is 190,000. So very similar. So, and also the pandemic's progress is also very similar. So I always felt that uh, Karnataka, not in terms of time, but time length. So Karnataka's first wave ended in October, and seven weeks later, second wave also came. First wave in Karnataka, as like UK, was five times the second wave. And uh, and and I don't know if this is going to be accurate. Uh, the third wave should come in October, in eight weeks' time, uh, after the first wave peaked, second wave peaked. So second wave peaked around May middle, so eight weeks should be around. Sometime next week, of course, but uh, that that can change because um, uh, various things are happening. I'll tell you in a second. So I always felt that UK was sort of, uh, sort of a way of understanding Karnataka in some sense, and uh, and UK is a little ahead. It's happening, but one in very very important thing is that how you you can see the third wave in UK just dipping like crazy, like like zooming down, and that's because the the yellow bar right there, they vaccinated people. So by May 9th, they had 26% who were double vaccinated. Okay. And uh, that's one of the reasons why the UK graph is coming down. And even now, even if you look at today, if you go observe UK cases, they're going up now, the typical Delta variant, but they're going to open up. Uh, that's because, uh, because of vaccination, uh, they're not getting any severe cases. So that may be one clear first indication of benefits of vaccination. If you vaccinate hard, you will get a dip, and the dip will tell you. Uh, it may be a dip in number of cases, or even if the cases come about, you will have a dip in hospitalization for sure, and life can return to normal at some point. So I have about six minutes left, so let me sort of... Uh... So what we did was we tried to sort of uh, understand uh, this is with uh, people from University of Virginia and Institute of Science. We developed a simple model uh, uh, to, to, to include vaccination and assume some sort of antibody waning. So, uh, so that this, we assume that reinfections are possible and uh, some antibody waning. And of course, uh, uh, like Professor Patmodinya said, that all models are inhibited by the fact that uh, there is no real biology, and that's something that really bothers me quite a bit every time I do more. So I've not done much modeling, but there's something that uh, I should keep in mind. There's no variant information in the model. 
So the model conclusions are that there will be a third wave, even if you have a strong no NPI. By NPI, I mean a, a non-pharmaceutical intervention like lockdowns, containment zones, uh, shops open at certain times, buses run at 50% capacity, schools close down. These are all NPIs. And if there's, if there's biological evidence of reinfections from antibody waning, then a third wave will come. And there's an interplay, which is kind of nice. Uh, if you increase vaccination, uh, you can have less NPIs, and you can open up the economy. So that's sort of the preliminary conclusions of the model. So uh, let me just uh, show you a snapshot. Uh, this is like a, this. You should think of it like sort of a very sort of mild predictive power in some sense. So the model was fitted in a certain certain manner. I will not go into it because of shorter time, short time. So, so, so the the red is the real data, and the the, the three curves in the model are, are with regard to uh, no NPIs, one third NPI, one half NPI, and six NPI. So these are uh, numbers that are uh, no NPI means it's there's no restriction on mobility. Everybody can move anywhere they want. One third NPI is is one third of that no NPI restriction. So within restrict, you can move around. And no restriction, and that's how the contact rates are developed in the, mo the model. And so all these, all in, no matter what NPI you are at, if you vaccinate at 167,000 per day, which is what was happening in, in early April, uh, the model predicts a certain third wave. Uh, of course, uh, the third wave could, uh, uh, could vary in intensity in terms of peak. It is a new variant. And because stochasticity could come a little earlier also. So one doesn't know that. These are both things that are, should be cautioned. So if you have antibody winning, if you have a certain vaccination, even if you have certain NPIs, uh, you will have a third wave, is what the model is uh, predicting. Uh, and uh, all these have been written up, and uh, some have been published as well. But if you go to Med Archive and search, uh, all these, a lot of things have been written up. Zero survey has been. The small thing about zero survey was it was government data, and the government was very keen that it's published publicly and uh, available in public domain. So I think this is one of the f uh, very rewarding aspects. We work with the government, and the and it sort of revive it sort of receives scientific feedback in the community, and I think very healthy going forward. I think all states should replicate it in some form or the other. Uh, the other two are modeling exercises that are available from public data. And uh, so this is sort of a lot of people to acknowledge, uh, and I have not done justice at all to them. Very little of mine is sort of uh, my own work. Uh, uh, so the survey team is huge. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a whole state department involved. And Rajesh uh, Sundaresan uh, and Girar Babu were the, were the people whom I worked with in terms of analysis. Uh, and uh, the Department of Health and Family Over Services is a huge team of counselors, staff in this department. Uh, various table directors and so on and so forth, a lot of district health survey officers and stuff like that. There's a lot of very rewarding work. I'll enjoy it. Going to district hospitals, seeing people work, it's very nice. I enjoy it. Of course, my students who are from undergrad students in my BMAT program and others, uh, other colleges as well, uh, who sort of have built the website in many ways in terms of data scrubbing. Then the IAC team, uh, it, the three of them worked with me on this website, but there are people working with Rajesh as well. Then University of Virginia has a has a huge bioinformatics center. Uh, I think it's called Biocomplexity Institute. Uh, Professor Mario Marathi is the one who's the chair of it, and there's a huge team of people working with it. And so on. Then uh, the Gates Foundation had some money, and then they have some three staff working with me on district timeline. So yeah, I think uh, I've taken uh, 40 minutes, and I think. Uh, I'll Thank you. Thank you, Shiva, for a, for a very nice talk and, and a, um, a different take on uh, how to gather data and how to interpret data. Uh, we have requested participants to post their questions uh, to the Google form because we are running late. I will just ask a quick question about your IFR and uh, CRI model. The graph that you had, it, does it have a temporal component or it's a snapshot? Snapshot, snapshot. Yeah. Snapshot. There's not. A, so I'm just just curious because you know for policy uh, making purposes, the temporal pattern of the 
you know, changes. Do you think that might be more? Uh, yeah, 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 it, yeah, can it, be done. It, it can be done. Yeah? It's coming. It, it, it's coming. So the second row survey will give us CIR. Second row okay. survey also has a subsidy component where we follow the cohort from the first survey. Right. So uh, these are all going to give state very, very useful information. Uh, the state already is analyzing it right now as we speak. Okay. Uh, data has already come in, and state is going to commission most likely a third one very soon, and which will also have a similar longitudinal aspects to it, like you explained. And it will be available very soon. It will be available in public domain. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's very exciting. We look forward to another talk by you then. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Shiva. Uh, that was Professor Shiva Atreya. Um, uh, we'll uh, move on to our uh, last speaker of today, Professor Arup Bose. Professor Arup Bose in statistical community doesn't require any introduction. Uh, he is a senior professor uh, with the StatMath unit of uh, Kolkata Indian uh, Statistical Institute. We are privileged to have him as adjunct professor with our school, School of Mathematics and Statistics at University of Hyderabad. Uh, irrespective of his busy schedule and numerous other commitments, he has always taken out time to be actively involved with our masters, students and research scholars, in particular when they are carrying out COVID-related projects. Our students have submitted projects. Our research scholar is uh, writing, uh, co-authoring a paper with Professor Bose. Uh, for, for the broader community, for COVID research community, uh, Professor Bose has worked on the Supermodel Committee and is very much interested in the modeling of COVID-19 spread. Uh, title of his today's talk is COVID-19 in India, Dynamic SIRD. Thank you, Professor Bose, and we look forward to hearing you. Thank you, uh, Professor Bhattacharji. Uh, so let me share my presentation. Do I not see that? Why am I having problem here? Just a minute. Ah, okay, now I have it. Okay, so uh, thank you again. Uh, so this is joint work uh, with uh, Professor Bhattacharya actually, and she has a, a SERB project. And the interesting thing is that the last trip I made uh, before COVID-19 shutdown was to Hyderabad. And it was almost, uh, I think it was 14th or 15th of March. So it was almost uh, right at the end uh, of our free uh, travel days. <clears throat> and I have not ventured out after that. I hope things will improve soon. Uh, so the, uh, the point of this talk is to uh, introduce to, especially to students, that you see a lot of graphs and charts on, uh, on uh, various uh, medias. And uh, what is it that, uh, that goes on behind, uh, behind that? So uh, what, uh, what kind of a model is, is uh, usually used to fit uh, the COVID-19 data or more generally uh, more you know, pandemic data and uh, how these uh, models uh, get fitted and then how these predictions are done. So that's basically what I'm going to focus on. So it's going to be elementary for many of you probably. Uh, uh, but I hope it will be of some benefit to uh, people who want to know, curi are curious how these models uh, arrive uh, in the scene and how they're fitted and what you can do and what you cannot do with them. Okay. So the uh, outline of the talk is uh, the SIR model is a, a very uh, popular model and it's um, almost a century old model. And uh, it's amazing that the, that model, which is a century old, is still a... Uh, a, a good model for explaining pandemics uh, almost across the board. So I will show you that how to modify this model. Uh, and there are many different modifications available in the, in the literature and uh, uh, in charts and plots that you see every day. Uh, ours is only one of them. And we'll uh, point out to you what are the uh, extra benefits or what are the uh, deviations from the standard model. And then I'll... Uh, explain to you what this a production number means. I'm sure you have seen this number also uh, quoted in um, all kinds of literature. So if you don't know, I'll uh, uh, explain uh, reproduction number uh, 
in easy terms. And then uh, I'll show you how to uh, get uh, um, how to fit these model uh, in a specific in, in the, for the COVID-19 uh, data in India and in and the states of India. And the special features of that will be that we use the aggregated uh, residual sum of squares instead of the uh, residual sum of squares only for the infected people. And then we use a geometric smoother, and then uh, that leads us to dynamic uh, temporal robust estimates. I'm going to explain all of that. And then uh, a quick view of uh, what happens if you do a short and long-term interval prediction with those, how you can do that. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, Indian COVID-19 data for March 14th to this should be actually June 31st, uh, so, so <clears throat> end of uh, last month. And then I'll very briefly mention uh, just when maybe one slide uh, that we're moving towards a spatio-temporal model and why that is uh, needed. Okay, so the SIR in uh, the SIR model stands for susceptible, uh, infected, and removed. Uh, uh, individuals from the population. And it's obvious what these uh, words mean, so I'll not go into the details. But usually removed means that if somebody who has uh, either, uh, either passed away or he has recovered, so that's how you remove uh, an individual from the uh, from the entire group. And in this case, uh, for COVID-19, you have uh, split into two parts. One is the recovered people and the other is the deceased people. And this model goes back to Kermack and McKendrick in 1927. As I mentioned, it was almost a century-old model, uh, along with several variations. And it's so important that it was reprinted in 1991 in, in three parts. And uh, here's a reference for that. Uh, so you can see they're uh, quite uh, long paper. So if everything about these models or contributions to the mathematical theory or epidemics, uh, it's uh, very instructive to uh, read those uh, three articles. And they are still relevant today. Uh, so what are the assumptions for this uh, SIR D model? D is for uh, that, that you, uh, for the recovery part, you also include the uh, uh, deaths and also D stands for, for dynamic uh, way of fitting the model as we'll see. So we assume that the, uh, so mathematically speaking, we assume that the epidemic propagates in a closed, completely susceptible, well-mixed population of a constant size. I'm not going to go into all the details of these things, but uh, these are the mathematical, we can call the axioms that uh, that you build your model on. Of course, every model is a, is an approximation to reality, and some models uh, act well, some models uh, do not act so well. So, but you have to start with some basic assumptions if you want to do a little bit of mathematics uh, to set up a model. And you assume that there is no demographic change. So, in other words, there is no net uh, births and deaths. Of course, that all these assumptions are, are not strictly valid in in reality, but the uh, the uh, deviations from these assumptions will not hopefully affect the uh, actual model uh, in reality. So the, the propagation happens at constant rates of infection, uh, recovery, and fatality. So you assume that, to begin with, that uh, the rates at which people get infected or at which people uh, recover and at which uh, deaths happen, they are sort of constant over time, which is, of course, not, not true. As you realize that Professor Bhattacharya asked this, uh, Siva this question, uh, that what happens to the, the temporal pattern. And then Siva said that uh, they will have a next uh, uh, snapshot of uh, where we can compare with the, the previous data with the, with the current data. So that will show you that this, these rates will definitely not remain the same. They will change over time. Uh, so the following parameters are held constant in the regular SIR model. Uh, so there are really essentially three parameters for the SIR model, namely the effective contact rate, uh, beta, recovery rate nu, and fatality rate um, nu. And it's obvious what their meanings are. What is a, you know, the rate at which uh, individuals get uh, contacted by, uh, uh, by infected people and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to go into detailed explanation of that. And now for us, they are constant only for each data window under modeling where the window shifts by a day, keeping the length fixed and the parameters are re-estimated. So uh, the, the basic SIR model has these fixed constants. And so then uh, you, you will see that it is set up as a differential equation where these three parameters appear as constant, uh, unknown, but, but constants. Uh, and uh, that's uh, going to change for, for when we try to uh, do a fitting, because as we realize that this, these rates will also, should also change with, uh, with time. So this is how the basic SIR uh, D model looks like. So suppose S is the cumulative number of susceptible individuals. 
uh, I is the cumulative number of infections, R is the cumulative number of recoveries. So capital letters will denote cumul cumulative numbers and small letters will denote the, the corresponding numbers at, at the time point T. And D is the cumulative number of fatalities. And N is the total uh, population size. And usually it is often normalized to one. So instead of looking at the total population, you, you uh, divide by the total. So S, I, R, and D will be proportions uh, lying between zero and one. Uh, then uh, this is the uh, model that uh, this is the these are the differential equations that uh, govern the SIR model. Uh, so there are four equations here, uh, and say, so they stipulate that uh, these uh, uh, variables S, I, R, and D they uh, they evolve over time uh, uh, by these uh, according to these uh, differential equations, and you can see that they and they add up to zero as it should be because S plus I plus R plus D should be equal to a constant. So there is no change over time, like we said uh, in the assumptions, there's no net birth and no net, uh, net deaths. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the way it, it propagates is given by these uh, specific differential equations. So uh, uh, now you can see that there is no randomness in this, uh, in this model. in Dragovol's uh, talk where he talks about the Sutra model. So these are all based on the, the essential, the primary uh, um, SIR uh, model and people make different kinds of variations depending on the, on the situation or depending on the kind of data that is available. Like for example, now you have vaccination data, so that should, could also be incorporated in the model. Uh, so there are many variations in the context of COVID-19. If you're interested, you can see some of the early papers uh, on the COVID-19 uh, uh, are these two, uh, these three actually. So, okay, so this is how typically a uh, um, uh, SIR model when solved uh, looks like. In other words, if I solve this equation, so I have S, I, R, and, and uh, S, I, and R, you can, because the total is N, you can essentially restrict to three graphs. So this is, uh, so depending on the uh, parameter combinations, you get uh, uh, different shapes of the of these three graphs. So these are, uh, so in this plot, I have uh, uh, given you the susceptible, infected, and recovered for a specific combination of beta, mu, and nu. It's not important what those combinations are. The point is to realize that we'll get different shapes of the curve depending on what those parameter values are. So here is uh, another example. So we as can see they're vastly different and went uh, beta. Okay, so now uh, uh, the epidemic has uh, has progressed, so there should be a uh, condition for the uh, epidemic to progress in the sense that it does not die out, but it keeps on infecting people. And that is that will happen if the derivative of the infected people, so if, if the rate is, is positive, and you can very easily solve for that, and it will turn out that you need this condition here, condition two. And remember that initially everyone except the first infected case is susceptible. So at, at the time point zero, the first instant is zero equal to one. So that shows that the for progression, we must necessarily have that beta over mu plus nu is bigger than one. The other thing to note here is that this is being set up as a differential equation. So the time variable is, is uh, uh, assumed to be continuous. But of course, in, in reality, your, uh, your data is going to be discrete uh, for for example, for COVID-19, you have the data for, for every day. So the time uh, becomes uh, discrete. But that's not a big issue. One can always discretize the model and, and, uh, and solve. So now, uh, as we realize that this is the progression condition, so if beta over mu plus nu is bigger than one, then the, then the pandemic or the epidemic will progress. Otherwise, it will die down because of this uh, equations uh, one and two. And, uh, it so happens that in the, this quantity here is, is related to the reproduction number. So what is the reproduction number? So uh, I'll try to explain that in, in general and then show you how it applies to this IR model. So there are three essentially parameters that drive an epidemic, uh, namely tau, C, and D. And uh, the tau, C, and D are uh, the transmissibility parameter, the average rate of contact, and the duration of infectiousness. 
So tau is the probability of infection given contact between a susceptible and an infected individual. So when a susceptible individual comes in touch in, in contact with the infect, infected individual, there is a probability uh, of uh, him uh, or her picking up the infection. So that is that is tau. Uh, and so uh, and similarly, the average date of contact C is between susceptible and infected uh, individuals. And the duration of infectiousness, once you get infected, how long you stay infected uh, so that you have a chance of, of transmitting that uh, uh, infection to other uh, individuals. Uh, the basic reproduction number, R0, is the expected number of secondary cases produced by a single typical infection in a completely susceptible population. So these are underlying assumptions. So com completely susceptible population means that everybody has uh, had a chance to get infected. Not, nobody is immune. So for example, does not treat the, the vaccination uh, situation. Uh, so this R0 is a, is a dimensionless less quantity. And in terms of tau C and D, it is nothing but uh, the... Uh, uh, Sorry, I think I missed uh, formula here. Okay, so uh, for the uh, uh, for the SIR, SIR model, this uh, the parameter beta is is related to tau C and D by the equation tau C equal to beta, and the uh, uh, D the parameter D is one over mu plus mu. And hence, what happens is uh, R zero, which is tau C times D, is uh, in general for for any uh, for any model. So then tau C times D is R0, which is equal to beta over mu plus mu. And so uh, we uh, come to the realization that the epide epidemic can progress if the reproduction number is bigger than one. And that is why you see this uh, in, in this media um, or in newspaper reports, this reproduction number is given and people talk, discuss about how high it is compared to uh, the base value one. So of course, if, if the reproduction number is the higher the reproduction number compared to the number one, then the epidemic has a, a bigger chance of, of progressing. Uh, the severity of the epidemic is an increasing function of R0. And that is why the reproduction number is important. Uh, and of course, uh, be because of equation three, its estimation is related to the estimate of beta, mu, and nu. If I want to estimate R0, I have to estimate beta, mu, and nu. Now, uh, this, is a tip, this is only for the SIR model. So because in equation three, I have used the three parameters, beta, nu, and mu, which came from the SIR model. So if I did not have an SIR model, the definition and, uh, and the interpretation and estimation of R0 will be quite completely different. And uh, so there's a very uh, nice paper by Van Drish uh, in 2017, uh, where you can look at the other models, how the, their definition and the interpretation and the estimation of R0, uh, how they are, uh, uh, they are done. Uh, uh, in, in general, it's much more involved. It so happens that in the SIR model, the, the formula for the reproduction is number is that simple as, as given in equation three. Okay, so uh, now uh, this uh, this plot here uh, uh, is just just for uh, illustration. It, it it tells you that uh, so first of all uh, uh, these rows represent regions. Uh, so I can think of India as, as split up into thirty six uh, uh, states and union territories, and uh, each of these rows are. Uh, for a few of those uh, territories. So in all, there are you know, 36 plots, uh, 36 uh, different graphs in, in, in total across the rows. And the vertical planes are the time series of infection. So this is the uh, how the infection has progressed. So each color code represents a, a state or a union territory. And the second column re represents the recovered uh, uh, individuals uh, uh, cumulative. And uh, this one represents, not sorry, the, the daily. And the, uh, this one represents the, uh, 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 the uh, daily fatalities in each of these, these states or union territories. And now you can see that uh, it's quite obvious, of course, that uh, in different states, uh, the, the progression of the epidemic was, was quite different for various reasons. And that is borne out by this, uh, this plots. And this is one of the reasons why uh, fitting the SIR model or any other model uh, for that matter would be always better if you go, go down in, into states rather than um, fitting it uh, in, uh, on the uh, Indian Indian data. Or if you could go back, go down to the districts at uh, Siva did in his, in his talk, you would be uh, even better placed. But unfortunately, the, the data is in many cases uh, is lacking at the district level. You, you cannot get reliable and uh, efficient data uh, in, in most cases. Uh, so Karnataka, of course, uh, as Shiva pointed out, has been uh, has been lucky in, in that respect. So, uh, of course, uh, there are different factors.
factors, influencing the model, for example, time, the model parameters should in, evolve over time. So this beta, mu, and nu, which are the basic uh, parameters of the SIR model, they should also change with time. So we should have some mechanism for doing that, while, especially while fitting it, and especially with interventions. And the regions, the time series data plots of the states and union territories of India, as I have pointed out, show that there are significant regional variations. So you should always try to uh, fit uh, uh, to as small as a unit as possible because of these variations. And hence, an SIRD model, uh, dynamic or otherwise, for the national data is not appropriate for local predictions. So now, because these parameters beta, mu, and nu are allowed to, to change with, with time, uh, we have called it the SIR, uh, the, the D model with a, a dynamic SIRT model. Uh, data at the level of smaller administrative unit regions are more informative, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, not easily available. And then finally, oh, you should, we should also be trying to investigate how different states or different regions affect each other. So for example, even within Karnataka, uh, um, uh, is there uh, relations between the different di districts and what kind of relations, you know, with the spread of the epidemic in one region, how does it affect the uh, other? So that's the spatial dependence uh, between connected and not necessarily geographically connected. You can have connections through air, for example, metro cities are, are connected by air, so the spread will be, uh, 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 will have one pattern if you look at those, uh, those uh, uh, states, uh, so not necessarily uh, uh, geographically connected regions. And this is ongoing work of uh, uh, Kapara Divya, uh, who is a PhD student of uh, and of course, there are also further factors. For example, there can be interventions, there can be locks, unlocks, zoning and travel restrictions, which you have seen. And there's migration, and there's level of compliance with the guidelines. Some places, some cities, some uh, districts uh, comply more, some less. And there is a, a problem of reporting also. There is under-reporting, there is delayed reporting, there is change in the methodology of uh, reporting, what you report and how you report. There are, of course, also clinical issues, which also changes over time in methods for case identification, what kind of test is being used, what are, what are the benchmarks for those clinical uh, methods, uh, methods of sample collection and, and laboratory testing procedures. So a lot of things which also change over, over time. And there have been attempts to incorporate at least some of these factors. Uh, so I refer to two papers here. Uh, at the end of the slides, I have uh, given the detailed uh, uh, references. And uh, this slide will be available to anyone who is... Uh, uh, who wants to look at them, so not an issue. Uh, so uh, um, the, to sum up, there are many different factors which will uh, affect the uh, basic SIR or SIRD model, and here are some of them. And it is quite hard to, uh, uh, to factor in all of these things uh, in your model because that will increase the, the dimension of the model, so to speak. You have, have many other parameters that will, that will come in, and then your, your model fitting, your... Uh, uh, estimation, your prediction, everything gets more and more complicated as you add more and more variables to your, uh, to your model. Uh, so we took a parsimonious approach. We do not try to uh, <coughs> delineate the effects of these external factors by adding further controlling parameters, and we continue with the basic SIRD model. But we let it evolve adaptively with the temporal data in each region. Uh, due to estimation based on shifting windows, the estimated parameters adapt to changes in the underlying observable as well as latent factors. So in a broad sense, uh, our approach is uh, similar to the non-parametric curve fitting in, in statistics. So you think of the beta mu and t, uh, mu and nu as not just fixed constants, but uh, a time series. So you think of these, these as uh, beta indexed by t, mu indexed by t, and nu indexed by t. So you're trying to fit a curve to this uh, uh, beta t, mu t, and nu t. Okay, so uh, what is our data source? So now this is the very standard data source uh, by now. So this is the volunteer-driven crowdsource database at COVID-19 India. And this data is updated daily. And there are, of course, issues like missing values, negative counts, delay in updating, change in the reporting format, all kinds of issues if you try to work with this. So we did some uh, initial checking, uh, consistency checks and cleaning uh, before we started using them to uh, fit, fit a model. And data is obtained only at discrete points, which I mentioned earlier. Even though the SIR model is actually a continuous time model, your data is going to be always always at, available at discrete points. And you, uh, <clears throat> so for any choices of the values of beta, mu, and nu, the SIR differential equation can be solved numerically. So that is uh, another important uh, 
track. So if I am given um, the values of S, I, R, et cetera, at a few time points, then I can solve this uh, differential equation uh, numerically if I, if I choose my data nu and mu. So uh, during estimation, what, what is, is done is you, you, uh, you separate these values parameters in, into grids of, uh, and, for, and then you optimize over this grid and then solve the, and fit a SID model and, and try to use a criteria to um, optimize with respect to beta nu and mu, uh, which uh, gives you the, within course, the best fit. So uh, this is a map for uh, uh, the cumulative infection counts in 36 regions. As, as we all know, there are very, you know, large differences between the different regions. So and that is, uh, this is the reason why you should be fitting an SIR model uh, uh, to regions and not to the entire country uh, at one go. And this is how the distribution of daily infections uh, look like for the 12 first hit, hit regions. So these are the 12 states which got, uh, states and union territories which got hit for the first time, uh, the, the first 12 states, and this is how their uh, uh, individual data uh, looks like for the, for the infections uh, as on June 30. So what is the software and hardware we use? So we use the, uh, we use the software R to, uh, to fit our models, and we use the library DSORT to solve the differential equations numerically, and the entire program takes a few minutes to run on, uh, on a standard uh, laptop computer, uh, and uh, uh, there is an archive article uh, for detailed plots and figures with data as on 31st August. And uh, there's a website of uh, Madhu Chanda where you can get the uh, updates uh, uh, usually uh, at the end of the month. So uh, the first uh, thing that we, novel thing that we do is that we, uh, uh, we use the uh, weighted aggregated residual sum of squares. So how is that? So all implementation of, of the SIR model and its variations that we came across use residual sum of squares of the number of infections. So everyone focuses on the number of infections. And after you, you uh, fix your grid uh, of, of values of beta mu and nu, and then you try to uh, uh, solve the uh, equation uh, uh, numerically, and then use the, uh, for the fit, you use the residual sum of squares based only on the number of infections and you forget about the number of recoveries, et cetera. And however, for COVID-19, we have information on recoveries and fatalities also. And that is why we uh, decided to use the way a weighted ag aggregate or a residual sum of squares over infections, recoveries, and fatalities. And why weighted? Because the, uh, the scale of uh, the, the infections and recoveries and fatalities are, are, are very different. The, as you already mentioned by two speakers, uh, the, the, uh, the fatality ratio is, is about 2%. So uh, uh, number of deaths will become much smaller compared to the number of infections and number of recoveries. So in the sum of squares that you compute to, uh, <clears throat> to judge your estimate, uh, all of them should, should not have the same weight. So a, uh, we use a appropriately uh, weighted uh, residual sum of square, aggregated residual sum of squares over these three variables. And uh, so the temporal initial estimates of, uh, temporal estimates of beta mu and nu are obtained uh, as follows. So at time point T, using the past seven days data, uh, we use the, we, uh, use the uh, uh, sum of squares, as I mentioned, of the infections and the recoveries and the deaths uh, for the, uh, for the TF period. And use, at any time point T, you, sum of, you aggregate over the past six, seven days. Uh, the estimated values of I hat, R hat, and D hat for given parameter choices are obtained numerically. Uh, by solving the differential equations. So you plug it back here and you look at this number that you, that you generate, and then you move over the grid, and the black parameter combination, which gives you the smallest value, is, is taken to be the, the estimates of beta, mu, and nu. So these estimates are then smoothened uh, further because they, they'll be very spiky in general, are then smoothened to yield robust final estimates. So how do you smooth these estimates? So we chose a weighted average over the last seven days, uh, estimate with geometrically decreasing weights of uh, 0.75 to the power, so uh, these are decreasing, and uh, other smooth, smoothers could also be used, and after trial and error, we settle on the value of 0.75. If you smooth it too much, then uh, the, the, the curves will look flat, and if you don't smoothen it much, then the curve will look spiky, so you have to sort of settle somewhere in between, and this is what we did by, uh, by taking 0.75 uh, after trial and error. You could, of course, use other uh, smoothers. Okay, 
So now, uh, having obtained the uh, <coughs> estimates for beta mu and nu, remember that now these are actually uh, varying with time. So at time point t, I'm using the past six days uh, uh, values of uh, the uh, different variables and uh, using the aggregated sum of squares and then using uh, geometric smoothing to eventually arrive at these uh, numbers beta t, mu t, and nu t. And as t progresses, I, I get uh, a time series of estimates. Uh, so now uh, it is time to estimate the reproduction number. Remember that the reproduction number is beta over mu plus nu. And so I can simply plug in the estimate that I got for beta mu and nu to estimate my R0. And uh, it, is, it turns out to be a very spiky estimate. So now, again, I have to sort of robustify this estimate. And the way we did it was by taking a median of a moving window of, of seven past values to obtain R0 t. So the reproduction number also becomes a function of, of time. And of course, instead of the seven day window, we could be more conservative, use more lags, or more adaptive, use only recent past. We could have also, of course, used other uh, means of robustification. And the final estimates, beta t, mu t, and mu t, and r0 t evolve over time. And at, at any given time point t, I want to mention that they do not necessarily satisfy this equation because we have done smoothing and et cetera. And this should not be a cause for concern since after all, the SIRT model is not expected to be a perfect model for the epidemic. And hence this equation is not sac sacrosanct. <laughs> so this is how it uh, looks like. Uh, so you look at the, uh, uh, as a sample. So if I look at the state of Delhi, then uh, uh, beta t, nu t and mu t and r zero t in the four different plots after smoothing and everything. Uh, this is this is what you uh, get. So the red one is the spike estimates and the, and the black one is the smoothed estimate. Okay. So having done that, then the, so you have fit an SI, uh, SIRD model, but then uh, one of the important goals of, a, of, of a getting a model is, is, is prediction. So how do I predict? So given at, at a time point T, given all these estimates, how do I predict my uh, uh, infection, number of infections, et cetera, uh, in, in, for the future? So, uh, so we use our estimates at the time point t minus one, uh, all these three parameter estimates to calculate the one step ahead prediction value of it, rt, and, and dt. That's that's not an uh, issue. This is done by solving the, the uh, uh, SIRD model numerically. And then we can also calculate the case step ahead predicted values. So predict, predicting uh, uh, numbers is, is not that uh, big a uh, issue. And while solving this, we found it extremely useful to add the obvious but crucial constraint that R plus D is always less than equal to I. Now, uh, uh, instead of point prediction, you would like to do a band prediction. But remember that the SIR model is not a random model, so there is no randomness to fall back on. So how do I create a, a prediction band? So somehow I have to devise uh, uh, error values. And this is how it is done. Uh, so. At any point t, uh, consider the past values. So let's look at the infection. So I have the past uh, observed values of i, and I also have the corresponding accumulated predicted values. So at any time point t, by using the, 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 the t minus 1 values, I have this uh, uh, i hat t's, which I calculated by solving the uh, differential equations with uh, numerically with those uh, uh, current values of, of beta at time point t minus 1. So I have these i's and I have these i, I hats. Of course, they will be different from each other. And then I can consider the empirical distribution of this t minus one error values, i minus i hat. So this is like, like the error. And so that gives me a sort of within course an error distribution. And the predict, then I can use this error distribution to, uh, uh, to come up with an interval uh, around uh, i hat t. Uh, these are not necessarily symmetric about the point estimate. And the same idea could be used for the other, other variables also. This is only for the infection that I have described. The width of the band uh, in this prediction remains the same uh, for the case step ahead predicted values as there is no updated empirical distribution. So it's to sort of a um, given given a time point t, I, I have these uh, error values and uh, I have no way of adjusting it as, as t goes, uh, t uh, uh, increases. Okay, so this is how the uh, uh, empirical predictive error distribution uh, looks like based on daily prediction of cases in in, uh, in Delhi on June 30th. So this is like for the uh, total number of cases, uh, the predictive values minus the actual observed values. If I look at the distribution at time point uh, June 30, this is how, this is how it looks like, and it's, uh, it does a quite uh, quite a nice uh, distribution of fitting uh, uh, because the error distribution is very well concentrated uh, at zero. 
and this is how the one day I had prediction and uh, 99 percent predictive bands for for daily counts looks like for the three different variables and this is how the uh, time series estimate of r0 uh, the reproduction number looks like for nine nine selected regions again as on june 30th so the dotted dashed lines are the spiky estimates and then you robustify you get the, these uh, values the black curve is the smooth end uh, estimate of r0 and uh, this is how the reproduction number looks like for 36 regions uh, it's quite instructive to just forget about everything else and look at the the progression of the reproduction numbers over time since, since the pandemic pandemic arrived and you will see how these uh, the the, 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 the uh, distribution of the reproduction numbers changes so the the ordering of the of the states and the union territories which had the highest, highest and the lowest one this ordering kept on changing over time and it's really very interesting to, to look at that and so this is a snapshot on, on June 30th. So the uh, uh, so you can see that most of the reproduction numbers are uh, uh, not too much. This uh, the maximum is 1.5. At one point of time, uh, some of the states had a, had a reproduction number of 2.5 or so. So we are doing uh, much better uh, as of now. And as I mentioned earlier, the uh, uh, data at the level of smaller administrative regions would be more informative, but not easily available. Uh, Karnataka is, is an exception, and it's important to formulate spatio-temporal models for the spread of COVID-19, even at the district level, and Kapara is, is working on that and has made some uh, progress with the district level data from Kerala. So Kerala is also another state where uh, um, good data is, uh, is available at the district level. So here are some references I, which I had uh, used in my slides, so I'll just put it up for 30 seconds. and. I come to the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bose. Any questions? I just had a comment that uh, in, uh, uh, your equation four was missing the weights and yeah. being aggregated residual sum squares, but that's uh, okay. Yeah, no matter how hard you try, you are always make some mistake or the other. Uh, I see uh, Professor Vidya Sagar and Professor Janeja here. Uh, uh, question. Yeah, parts of the please go on. Uh, yeah, I want to ask a question to Arup. Arup, you mentioned that the R-naught estimates have changed, uh, um, you know, the rankings of the states uh, or the ordering of the states uh, with respect to R-naught have changed over time. Uh, yes. What makes these, what has caused these changes? Do you know, are these, uh, uh, like Shiva said, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions or what? I mean, vaccinations. No. Uh, have you been able to pinpoint that? No, we have, we have not looked at that problem yet. I, I believe that if you do some some uh, spatial modeling, maybe something will come out of that. I mean, it's also related to spatial modeling. But no, we have we do not have the answer to that yet. But it's very interesting. Maybe I should have given a curve for all these R not estimates over over different months uh, for the different states. That would have been uh, interesting. I, I forgot to do that. Yeah. But it's very interesting to see how how one state overcomes uh, overtakes the other and then falls back and so on. But I we don't know what made that happen. Maybe Modishanda has some ideas. I don't know. I mean, quite obviously, there are too many factors: uh, pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical interventions, and also, uh, as uh, Professor Bose said, there are a lot of uh, changes at a lower administrative level. So, uh, it, uh, the main problem always has been to get the consistent data at that clarity at that uh, geographic region. We haven't had that. We would love to make such modeling, but we couldn't. And we had to do the best we could do. Ours, ours is kind of a black box model. That is why, because we're not getting enough data to answer the question Parthada just asked. Uh, Arup, one question for you. Yes, Sandeep. So, you know, I guess one test of curve fitting is that you come up with a prediction for two months later and then check two months later, okay, how good was that prediction? Yes. Do you do any of that kind of analysis? Yeah, we have done that. I have not shown it here. I think for about uh, 7 days to 30 days, uh, we, we were doing quite well. 
And so if you predict ahead about one month, they're doing quite well. And the overall prediction, long term, like uh, last months, um, when we did our prediction, say in December, maybe Madhuchandra can correct me if I'm wrong. I, uh, when we did, did it in December, we had predicted the pandemic, the, the first wave. Well, the, at that point, time, point of time, there was no concept of first or second wave. We had uh, um, sort of our prediction said that the um, end of April it will be nice, uh, within course nice, yeah. So, but uh, then the second wave took over. So we are so short term predictions uh, are very good. Long term predictions, as as you as you know, there are different biological things that that, that keep on happening, mutants and all that. So it's, it's very hard. Madhuchandra, would you like to add to that? Yeah, uh, we got around the second week of March, where, uh, which kind of uh, fitted quite well uh, with what we saw. And uh, the other thing, uh, what uh, Professor Bose said, yes, ours, uh, we should not do long-term prediction with our kind of model, because this is this is in the spirit of non-parametric car fitting. So it, it's not suited for long term. If you want to do long term uh, prediction, there should be more controlling or explanatory parameter that actually captures the, uh, the underlying mechanism. We have made it as a black box. So anyway, our model should not be used for any long term prediction. Short term, we have tested many times. We do quite well in short term, after a month, as everyone the most said. And if I understand correctly, you're fitting to the cases, reported cases. Is that right? Uh, no, yeah. all the three series. So, yeah, all please. the three series. All yeah. the three series. Cases so, recovered and, yeah. Because uh, reported cases were changing with the government testing strategy, right? Oh, you yes. suddenly start doing the major testing. So, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's yeah I mean, case definition, yeah. Uh, reporting, testing procedure, a lot of things change, non-biological uh, factors took over. So, okay. so for example, uh, the the migration we, we do not have do not have migration data, so to speak, or almost almost nil. And uh, it, it is believed that the migration had had some effect on uh, on the pandemic. Maybe maybe not in all India terms, but uh, we did not find any evidence. Uh, I mean, if you look at the period when the actual migration happened, we did not really find the evidence of uh, of the effect of migration uh, that much. And maybe maybe there is a small effect, but not not too much, right, Madhushanda? Yes, we did follow uh, because in, in fact, Professor Bose did a detailed uh, study of the path of the migration and the tentative volume, and we followed up. Uh, that those parts, those regions, we, we have not seen any significant effect of that in the outcome. That, that is our finding. And maybe now that we have a variant, you can have uh, another class of infected people, people infected by old variant, people infected by new variant, they have different yeah. rates. You can model that also in some kind of uh, framework. Yeah. Possible. Possible. And then, of course, vaccination. That's a that that will major. That's a major component that needs to be added to the True. to the model. Yeah. True. Sure. True. And I'm sure uh, Manindra will will do some of this stuff uh, tomorrow. I don't know what uh, you know exactly what he has in mind, but if the sutra model, he'll explain the sutra model tomorrow, and uh, we should see some more variables added to the model. Okay. Good. We, yeah, we have Professor Vidyasagar. If you he would please uh, comment or give his observations, we would be. Happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Yeah, maybe he has stepped out for a moment. He had joined. He has know. unmuted himself, so. Yeah. Me? Yeah. Um, so, the, so we wanted if you would like to add to this. Um, it, if you were yeah. a couple so, of questions, uh, I, I, this model maybe. Uh, Marinda is going to give a talk tomorrow. I, I, I forgot to connect my external microphone. So you should be able yeah. to hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, you. I, I, was, I was going to say, I don't know what Marindra will talk about. I won't guess. But I mean, the whole point about this model is to uh, detect phase changes. You know, we will show that uh, uh, two quantities, uh, which, one of which is a linear function of the measurement, but the other one is a nonlinear measurement. 
but those two quantities satisfy linear relationship. And then uh, so long as the data falls on the straight line, things are going along fine. And there is no reason to, uh, so I was gonna say, there is no a priori prediction of how long a phase will last. When the points don't lie on a straight line, you recalibrate. We've had phases as short as seven days. We've had phases as long as 45 days. So for example, during the March, April period of this year, uh, we can almost say there were no phases because the estimates were changing practically day to day. That's because of the Delta mutant and also the fact that people were not bothering about um, you know, COVID compliance. And the second point is also that in our view, and let me say more precisely, in my view, it's much easier to detect that something has changed then maybe go back and look at newspaper headlines or biological data to see what has changed rather than try to predict. So I think that our uh, idea would be these predictions are based on the current uh, set of parameters and then we sort of indicate uh, the extent to which these uh, predictions are reliable and when they become unreliable then we change the data. So in some sense, it's slightly backwards from the usual way in which we do things, because usually in science, we make a prediction and then we stick to it. In our case, we make a prediction and then when we see that the, the so-called straight line linear relationship doesn't hold anymore, then we recalibrate the model. But I think the key to the Sutra model, and again, I don't know how Manindra will present it, to me, the key to the Sutra model is it's data-driven. So it tells you when you need to recalibrate. And, and I just emphasize once again that the phases can be as short as one week. They can be as long as six to eight weeks. So, for example, right now, there's hardly any change. We haven't changed. So Karnataka has been in the same phase for about two months now, for example. So anyway, so it's a great uh, initiative. I don't know who the brain is. Was it Aru uh, putting this thing together? But yeah. uh, <laughs> whoever it is, it's a very enjoyable session. And I will uh, also join tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, most so likely, I'll skip Manindra's talk. But other than that, I'll be there. <laughs> Yeah, we we plan to have subsequent workshops maybe with the other speakers and so on. So, are we okay? Well, that's good. I look forward. Yeah, to we that. decide to continue that uh, as far as possible. Yes. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. As, as Professor, we just I guess say thank you, sir, and I I hope to see you tomorrow also and uh, our other participants. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll be there. Thank you, thank you, sir. Actually, this workshop is uh, is uh, because of nudge from Professor Bose. Uh, Professor Bose is involved here as a junk professor with our students, research scholars, and he uh, knew I had this CERB project, so he was pushing me that you should uh, conduct a workshop. And uh, uh, many of the I planning and what should go in and in it is uh, is his uh, motivated by his ideas. Thank. Uh, Many, many thanks to Professor Bose and many thanks to our very patient uh, participants. We have had so many glitches today. We're still having glitches, but they have been fantastic participants. I look forward to see you all tomorrow. Uh, I thank all the three speakers and our really distinguished participants. Um, uh, thank you all. Have a nice rest of the day. Uh, we will all see meet tomorrow again. Thank you. Thank you.